Uh, hi, I'm Jason Furman. I'm, I'm here to welcome you today to this event at the Hamilton Project. And you know, one of the great things about the Hamilton Project, and we're going to get this today, is you get a combination of the broader economic thinking on a topic area, but combined with motivated and linked to very specific policy proposals um, for what you can do in that area. And today we're going to do it for one of the biggest and I think most interesting areas in both economics and the economic policy debate right now, um, which is place-based policy. Um, to motivate that, I'm going to tell you what I learned in graduate school about this topic 25 years ago. Um, I learned that there was, you didn't need to worry very much about place-based policy um, for two reasons. One, that there was really strong convergence. That if you looked at the places that in you know, the late 19th century that were poor, they were one-tenth as rich as the richest places at the end of the 19th century. Um, and by the year 1990, they were only you know, a third as poor um, as those places. As capital migrated to places where workers were cheap, um, and even more importantly, as workers migrated to places um, where there was opportunity. And so this convergence between places, basically if you had a concern, you could just wait for it to be solved, um, and it would be. The second was the economics of the policy in this area, which is when people can move from place to place, it means if you do something for a particular place, you can't actually help a person. Because you build a new factory, you do a new subsidy, you do a new infrastructure project. And that will attract more people to the area. By attracting more people to the area, wages won't actually go up. All that will go up is what economists think of as the inelastic factor, the thing that can't change, which is land. So if you try to do anything for places, even for poor people in places, you're going to end up benefiting the landlords from the fact that you made that place more attractive, um, not the people um, that live there. And that you should find you know, poor people wherever they are, not look for poor places. Both of these ideas um, are now being challenged and questioned. In part, it's because the facts have changed. In the last 30 years, instead of states converging States are diverging, and places are diverging. Their Hamilton Project, in their excellent volume that you have today, documents the two times difference in the median income in the top 20% of, of um, states versus the bottom 20%. It's hard to predict the future, but when you look at the fact that 75% of VC funding goes to three states, or that half of patents are in just 50 counties makes it look an awful lot like this divergence will continue um, in the future. And then underlying all those theorems that said help people not places was that people could move freely. And we're seeing people move um, less and less than they used to. So all of this both increases the motivation for focusing on places and also raises the possibility um, that those policies um, should work. I should say I'm still not fully convinced, but I'm open-minded, which is why I'm looking forward to today's discussion, because it still is the case that you know, our place-based policies can be designed poorly um, and distorted by the political system, that they can end up helping somebody in one place but leave out poor people in another, that we can do some, you know, create 10 zones that between them have 3 million people and kid ourselves into thinking we've done something for 330 million people in America, and that we can build huge infrastructure projects in a place that actually suffers from a lot of problems, um, but not really lack of infrastructure, because it has fewer people than it has um, roads. So I think there's still quite a lot to be skeptical of, quite a lot of pitfalls here, but I don't think anyone could say that the status quo is one that's defensible that we shouldn't be thinking hard, and especially thinking hard about all the place-based policies we already do. So one of the papers that Tracy um, Gordon co-authored for this points out, we already do, I think, $700 billion a year. Um, how can we do that 
um, better. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion because this is something that you know, economists are having fresh set of debates around. Um, politicians, of course, have always done place-based policy, and if you're the governor of a governor, governor, where's governor, governor of a state, um, you know you can't do national policy. All you can do is place-based policy. So um, it's definitely here to stay. We should figure out how to do better, um, but maybe um, we should have an open mind um, towards changing our attitude towards it. So just wanted to conclude by thanking the Hamilton Project um, for this excellent event. You have a great introduction to this volume, co-authored by Jay Shamba, by Ryan Nunn, who has the disgraceful um, legacy, which I'm now going to share with all of you, as he was offered in 2016 a job to work on the staff of the Council of Economic Advisors, because we thought he was the very best person in Treasury's Office of Economic Policy, and he rejected us to go work at the Hamilton Project, not that I'm bitter, um, um, and Jana Parsons, who I also had a chance to work with. So it's a great introduction. It's a great set of um, policy proposals that you'll hear from the authors, um, but now we'll hear from David Leonhardt um, and Deval Patrick as they talk about these issues. Thank you. Well, while the governor gets mic'd, uh, I will state the obvious, which is we are enormously fortunate to have Governor Patrick with us today. Um, uh, you can read a much longer version, but um, the highlights are he um, ran the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department under uh, President Clinton, um, uh, served as a two-term governor of Massachusetts, and is currently managing director of Bain Capital Double Impact, which tries to both make money and do good at the same time. Tries to and does. And does. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, Thanks for having me. Uh, so I guess I want to start in uh, the broadest possible way, which is, and then we'll get to place-based, which is um, I, if you could kind of frame for us the larger problem here. It seems to me that there are so many people in this country who feel frustrated about being left behind. Mm -hmm. um, they are concentrated in um, places that feel left behind, but that this notion of the stagnation of living standards um, for broad numbers of people, some combination of the middle class and the working class and the poor, strikes me as one of the central challenges our society faces. Mm -hmm. And I'd just love to hear how you're thinking about that problem. Mm. Start with the hard one. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I'd say that the, um, you know a little bit about my story, David, my personal story. I grew, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Um, most of that time, much of that time on welfare. Um, and uh, through a series of opportunities and people who paid attention to me and great schools and, uh, uh, and adults who involved themselves, um, have had extraordinary opportunities and, um, uh, and you know, some of the accomplishments that you describe. I remember, I tell the story about uh, our youngest daughter um, when she was in kindergarten here in Washington. In the 90s. In the uh, 80s. In the 80s. Uh, having the homework assignment of, uh, uh, they were studying changes in the seasons and she was asked to uh, describe uh, to mom and dad um, the four seasons. And so she came home and said, uh, first you drive up and the doorman takes your car. <laughs> uh, and she's, my wife said, sweetheart, that is not what they're talking about. Um, she was describing her several visits to the Four Seasons Hotel. Um, but one generation. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's a story that is not told as often as we'd like in this country, but it's told more often in this country than any other place on earth. That's an American story. And that story, I think, is being told less often now than it used to. So when you say people are feeling stuck, it's not just they're feeling stuck, they are stuck. Mm -hmm. They are. Uh, and what uh, uh, many people on the south side of Chicago have been feeling for a long time, because there were lots of other creative, inventive, ambitious folks who, who didn't get the breaks uh, I did, um, what they're feeling on the south side of Chicago, uh, folks are feeling more broadly. In fact, I used to say, um, 
uh, in the recession that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, when I was in office, it, um, poor folks have been in terrible shape for a long time, but after the recession or during, um, uh, the middle class were a paycheck away from being poor. Mm -hmm. um, and they were terrified by that. So what I feel we often describe as income inequality as a, is a shorthand for economic mobility. That's you know, it's the ability to move from where you are to where you want to be that is the source of continuing anxiety, notwithstanding what the statistics say about the strength of the economy. And the reason we should worry about that is because I think that ability to move is central to the American story. Um, and I do think, uh, and I say this as a, as a Democrat and as a, as a patriot, I think government has a role to play in that, not in helping, not in solving every problem in everybody's life, but in helping people help, them, help themselves. I think government has to step up uh, and see that role. Now, does it have to be one strategy? Is it place-based versus people-based versus something else? You know, the only... Uh, uh, the only uh, elective uh, position I've, I've had in government is, is as a governor, and, uh, and what I wanted and what I sought was multiple l levers. You know, I never saw it as just having or wanting one magic bullet, as, uh, as it were. I wanted lots of different ways to improvise and to try things, um, and, uh, and I wanted ways to bring uh, the private sector and, uh, and advocacy groups and individuals uh, to the table, lots of different uh, voices and ideas, so we could, we could see what worked. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and we did try some things, um, some of which worked spectacularly and some of which worked less so, and I hope we can talk about some of it. Yeah, it's, when, when you, it's such an affecting story about your daughter, and when I hear it, and I would guess other people have the same reaction, I immediately go to thinking of, of my own family stories of pride at past situations that have been overcome. And then you flip that and you think about how angry people must be if they have not had that experience sure. in their family, right? They didn't work any less hard in all likelihood right. than your family or my family, and you understand that anger. That's right. So let's talk about this notion of what works and what works less well. Let's, let's start with place-based strategy. Jason did a really nice job of, of very honestly laying out some of the questions about place-based strategy. As he always does. Um, uh, and I think those are fair questions to ask, right? I mean, should actually, is it the role of government to get involved, federal government, to get involved in a specific way and deal with um, and, and try to target specific places? Or when you combine pork um, from Congress with the idea of kind of a race to the bottom among localities, are, are the downsides of place-based strategies so large that you worry that even if they are a good idea in theory, that in practice they can't really work. How do you balance those two ideas? Well, I, I, you know, we we have a uh, we have a book and a lot of uh, really brilliant uh, economists who've who've uh, contributed to that book and to thinking on these on these policies. So I feel underqualified to give a, a uh, definitive response to your to your question. I do think that what we need in uh, uh, in government um, is what we are getting more and more in the private sector, which is a lot of innovation. Mm -hmm. um, what we what we need for successful innovation is a is to raise our tolerance for failure, but politics punishes failure. So I think we also have to raise our tolerance for failure in that space as well. We got to try some different things um, and not um, feel like we have to have one solution. Now, with that frame. I would say that, um, look, you have, we have to be careful not to just accept that places where poor people are are just going to be places where poor people have to be. In other words, that we are locking in uh, segregation and poverty because, you know, that's the way it is. I, I don't accept that. I don't think we should accept that. And that is one risk, anyway, that I see in... Uh, in, in other words, that the good intentions of focusing on economic uh, development based on place sometimes um, lock in the poverty or push away the, par the poor people to other places where there is not uh, uh, poverty without actually dealing with the causes of the, uh, of the poverty, building up the capacity of the people 
um, who were uh, uh, who were living lives of uh, of poverty, who were in fact uh, stuck. So th there has to be, it seems to me, some blend of uh, capacity building that goes with um, human capacity building that goes with um, place-based strategy. So I give you an example of yeah. how we thought about it um, uh, when I was in office. So. We had lots of big plans um, when I ran, and, uh, and so this is 06. This is 06, yes, and uh, and then I won, <clears throat> and the bottom fell out of the global economy. So um, the first order of business was um, trying to climb out of that hole, and I remember we had a group um, of a uh, of, you know the Governor's Economic Council, which was uh, uh, esteemed economists um, and business leaders who uh, uh, came in and said, Governor, we feel uh, uh, it important to advise you that Massachusetts historically has gone deeper into recession than most other states and stayed longer. And I said, well, thank you very much for that. <laughs> Where do we go from here? Um, and uh, you know, it was, it was apparent to me from experiences in the private sector and just from common sense that uh, we were not going to come out of recession without a strategy. We weren't, it wasn't going to be just, you know, waiting and hoping. We were going to have to have a plan. Uh, and so we decided to focus uh, on three things, education, innovation, and infrastructure. Education because um, it's the single best long-term investment in human capacity. And by that I meant pre-K through life learning. Mm -hmm. um, capacity building. And there were strengths we had naturally. Um, you know, we have 300 colleges, universities, research institutions, teaching hospitals within 45 minutes of downtown Boston. It's one of the most extraordinary concentrations of brain power on the planet. Um, there were collaborations between public and private institutions that had not happened. And so thinking about how to use the convening power of the governor just to help that happen. Um, uh, we had already a high standards approach to um, pre-K, but they, there was a lot more room for innovation in that space. Uh, and at the worst of the challenges in the state budget, thanks, frankly, uh, to the Obama administration stimulus bill, we were able to invest in, uh, in uh, K to 12 public education at the highest level in the history of the Commonwealth. And the students repaid us by achieving at the highest levels mm -hmm. in the history of the, uh, of the Commonwealth, which was its own magnet for attracting more and more uh, business investment into the state. Innovation, because there are a handful of industries that depend on that kind of concentration of, of, uh, of brain power. Life sciences is one of them, but so is, uh, so is clean tech, so is uh, precision manufacturing. There are a host of, uh, of others, and they are not all white coat PhD type jobs. Um, they are jobs up and down the, uh, 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 the range of, uh, of skill sets. Uh, and we had to be intentional about that range of skill sets. So we were reaching into different uh, communities, again, around capacity building. So there was overlap, if, if you will, in the education strategy and in the, uh, uh, and in the uh, innovation strategy. And then infrastructure, I describe as the kind of unglamorous work of government, but it's, it's, what's a, it's what government does, in my view, um, uh, to support and encourage private investment. So it's roads, rails, and bridges, yes, but it was also broadband um, expansion, including into places that, um, uh, that didn't have it. And we have places that are as rural and remote in Massachusetts as um, you could possibly imagine. Uh, we, have, we also, you know, it was also about universal access to, uh, to health care, and we were ahead of the nation in that respect. And, achieved 99% uh, coverage um, for our citizens without break, breaking the uh, state budget. Um, you know, all those things that make it possible for, for individuals to, um, uh, 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 to um, that enable individuals uh, to take advantage of uh, private sector opportunities. And, you know, it, it, it takes a little while to get that machine going, but uh, we came out of recession faster than most uh, other states, and after eight years, we had a 25-year employment high. So I, I do think it's not thinking about just one thing. I'm sorry to go on, no, but no. It's, it's not, for me, it wasn't thinking about just one thing. 
It was about how to get these things to come together um, and think about it, frankly, the way a citizen would experience it, um, how to get different elements of their experience um, kind of functioning more, uh, more uh, coherently. First, I should tell you all, I'm not going to monopolize the question. So the, the good folks from Brookings and Hamilton will be circulating cards. Please um, write a question on one of them, and we'll get them up, and then um, and I'll ask them. So in Massachusetts, actually, in some ways, is obviously a very, a very different state from other parts of the nation, number one, in education. But in other ways, it's really a microcosm of the country, in that particularly in this notion of place-based strategy, in that I, would, I haven't looked at the statistics recently, but I would imagine that if you look at median income, Boston has pulled away from the rest of the state, the Boston metropolitan area. And so you've had growing regional gaps when you compare it to the central part of the state, the North and South Shore. And so- And we also have income disparity. You have income disparity, and those two things interact with each other, right? That, that, and so when you were going through these strategies, infrastructure, innovation, education, um, can you give us an example of, of an area in which you said, wait a second, if we're not careful, too many of these gains will just go to Boston and Newton and Brookline. Yeah, yeah. And so um, if we just left it up to kind of the private market or even the normal government dynamic, and so we're going to go out of our way to make sure that the benefits of this go in places where they might not otherwise have gone. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you maybe two, um, two examples. One that was... Um, uh, I would call a medium success, and the other that was a failure. Um, but back to this point of interconnectedness. So, um, in the uh, in the life sciences, one of the as that began to explode, um, one of the critical needs was um, lab technicians. That's a medium skills job. It's an entry level job or just above an entry level job. You don't have to have a college degree uh, Not for even it. a two year? Um, it helps, Okay. but the community colleges can help with certifications. Okay. So you don't necessarily need- An associate. You need a high school um, uh, 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 diploma, but you don't necessarily need an associate degree. It helps, but, you, but the community co colleges can provide certifications um, and, uh, and they are a step toward a, an associate um, degree. And, um, you know, you are in, I don't know if you know the Boston area, but uh, Roxbury, Dorchester, which is a, uh, a concentrated, par um, uh, uh, an area of concentrated poverty, um, uh, high concentration uh, community of color, is walking distance from some of the greatest teaching hospitals in the world. Mm -hmm. um, huge need for lab technicians. And, um, but the, but the, um, supply of, uh, you know, the most folks, or a lot of folks in Roxbury and Dorchester weren't thinking of opportunities as lab technicians in the, in the teaching hospitals. Uh, and frankly, um, uh, I didn't really have the sense that the teaching hospitals were thinking of sourcing uh, from uh, Dorchester and, uh, and, and Roxbury. So how to get, how to get the, uh, we started to think about how do we get um, Roxbury Community College to start teaching and preparing students there for um, for jobs in the uh, in the teaching hospitals, and we try to be intentional about that. We try to create partnerships between employers in biotech and RCC for those um, jobs. And I say I would say we were moderately successful, not wildly, mm -hmm. but moderately. Um, uh, but that was again, you, you know, it was trying something, seeing where the gaps are, being intentional about it. Um, the South Coast, which is, uh, so think of, I wish we had a map, but um, uh, uh, New Bedford, Fall River. Um, Near the Rhode Island border. Yes. Yes, south, southeastern Massachusetts. Exactly. Um, for 30 years had been promised the resumption of train service, uh, commuter rail service by every gubernatorial candidate of both parties. To Boston, to Providence, to, to both. To Boston. To Boston. Um, by every candidate from both parties. Um, and we had committed to this and started work on it and spent money uh, on it because um, there are lots of reasons why that community's economy and future depended on being reconnected to uh, the jobs and opportunity in Boston, and frankly, why 
Boston's housing shortage and costs depended on being reconnected to more affordable opportunities in, uh, in the South Coast. I mean, imagine being, you know, working in, in, in Boston and being able to take a 45 minute ride to the South Coast at the end of, end of the day and live in an affordable apartment right. with a view of the water. Pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we uh, went to the legislature and to the people um, to, um, to raise money for that, uh, for that project. And we had the support of the general public, according to polling, and a lot of work we, uh, uh, a lot of work we did um, to build that, uh, that case, and we couldn't get the legislature to go along. And that was all about how not to leave out a part of uh, the community that was very much in need. And, uh, but we couldn't get the speaker. Why not? That's a whole other story. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's, that's about, yeah, that was politics. Yeah. Um, so. Can you think, so there was an interesting piece in Bloomberg recently, I believe by Noah Smith, and I apologize if I'm getting that wrong, about College Station, Texas, um, yeah. arguing that the single best model for um, development of some of these smaller metro areas is education mm -hmm. and higher education. Mm -hmm. Um, which feels right to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you agree with that? And can you think of counterexamples, or not counterexamples, but other examples, for smaller communities in Massachusetts or elsewhere that aren't going to be able to build themselves around higher education? What are the other options for building uh, a local economy that so feels like it, first of all, it can I thrive? I want to underscore, uh, I want to, I want to um, uh, violently agree with the premise that a local college or, or, uh, or university can be an economic hub. You know, taking down those, those gates and, uh, and opening the doors out to the community is a really, really powerful formula we found in Massachusetts and I have seen in other places. And that's, that's not just in Boston. That's true in Worcester. It's true in Springfield. Uh, it is also true in New Bedford um, and, in, uh, and in Fall River. And those universities that are just outside the city that move a satellite into the, into the city or, or, or town, enormously uh, important. And getting collaborations in the entrepreneur uh, or creating an entrepreneur cl cluster so that the intellectual property of the university is commercialized outside the university is a terrific um, formula. And government, I think, can help by thinking about where the holes can be plugged, what, what infrastructure is wanting um, uh, uh, in different places. And I'll, I'll just park that. Okay. I think that other ways you can think about it, though, are... Um, you know, not every, not every community has to have a university already um, uh, in place. You know, I think Pittsburgh has had tremendous success because they've already had one. But there are communities in, uh, in other places. I mean, I think about the number of companies today that, uh, that need tech support uh, and great organizations like, um, uh, like uh, Resilient Coders, which is one of these boot camp um, uh, organizations that in 14 weeks uh, takes uh, 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 kids from a DYS situation or um, just bright kids who haven't had a chance um, and, uh, and prepares them for entry-level uh, jobs. I think the average entry-level job for a kid from Roxbury today at, uh, from Resilient Coders is an uh, entry-level job is $70,000. They had their first uh, 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 entry level job at hundred thousand dollars in this last uh, in this last cohort. That's transformative. Yeah, that's transformative. And many many companies aren't th that are that need tech uh, um, support um, don't necessarily think of themselves as tech companies now because if you have access uh, uh, to high speed um, internet, you have a market that's um, that's global. In fact, so um, uh, how we think about the the meaning of access to, uh, 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 to the internet and the support that's necessary to make that. Uh, is it Chattanooga? Help me. Was it Chattanooga that, uh, that made a decision, I, don't, I want to say 10, 15 years ago, that they were going to invest in high-speed um, internet as their, as their future, right? It's transformative for that city, right? They made a purposeful decision that their um, they were going to bet their future on uh, uh, on the future of the 
uh, of the web, and it has, um, and they've organized an economy around it, having a strategy, making an investment, understanding that there was a public and private, uh, uh, there were public and private dimensions to that uh, that strategy, and then being intentional about it, I think is uh, in, is enormously important, whether or not there is a a university component. Yeah. We have some great questions. I'm going to start to dive into them. Take the easy um, one first. <laughs> it's, I'm going to take the personal one first. How do you advise young people now who are seeking to leave places for better opportunity as you did? It seems to me another way to think about that is we care about people more than places, right? And so is it, it, do, should we worry so much about places or is it perfectly fine to have people going looking for the opportunity? Wow. Whose question was that? <laughs> May have been from Twitter. There's a mix of Twitter and in person. Oh, Twitter. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, you know, I every once in a while, um, I get folks who contact me and they want to. They come in and they ask for a version of career advice like that. Um, it's, it's particularly difficult when they say, you know, I've. I want to be a governor one day. You know, tell me how to do that. What's what's the path? And I tell them they're asking the wrong person because I have zigged and zagged. Um, I I think for me, among the most important um, lessons uh, is about getting intentionally outside your comfort zone so that you learn that you have the capacity to figure it out. When I graduated from college, I was interested in going into business. I was interested in going into law. I was interested in going into the seminary. Um, I applied to all those things. Um, I was rescued from my indecision by, uh, by something called the Rockefeller Traveling Fellowship, um, which was awarded to three graduating seniors. And the requirement was that you spend a year in a non-Western non um, culture and they gave you enough money to get there and get back. And I think, <laughs> I think the reason for that was so that you wouldn't be tempted to hole up in the local intercontinental hotel and kind of wait it out. Yep. And I wanted to go to Africa because you know, I'd never traveled outside the United States before. I just wanted to go to Africa. I wrote to everybody I knew who knew somebody in Africa, and I got one answer from one person on a development project in Khartoum. And he said, get here and we'll figure it out. So I, uh, I got a backpack, and I filled it up with what I thought I needed, and I landed in Cairo, having taught myself the greetings and the numbers in Arabic on the flight from Athens. And after a few weeks, I hitchhiked from Cairo to Khartoum, which took about, this is about 1,200 miles, took about three weeks. And I learned when I found my way to his office that he had left the week before for two years in Long Beach, California. <laughs> And he said nothing to his office about what I was supposed to do. And the, uh, and the person who was the head of the project said, we don't have anything for you and didn't know you were coming. Get out of here. Um, and, uh, you know, in those days, you couldn't, there, you know, there were no cell phones. There wasn't Twitter. Um, you know, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, call home for a lifeline or anything like, like that. And frankly, there was, my family wouldn't have been able to throw me a lifeline. I eventually talked my way on the, onto the project, and basically to get rid of me, they sent me to Darfur, which was another 700 miles over the Nubian Desert. You know, no airport, no train to get there, no roads, frankly. You had to get space on top of a cargo lorry, and you rode on, uh, on tracks through the sand for five days. I'll leave aside flipping over and being stranded out in the desert for three days. But I lived out there for... Seven months, you know, no phone, no mail, um, and I figured it out. You know, I learned the language. I, I learned how to make friends, how to do the job, you know, how to feed myself. And, and, and when, when you figure out that you can figure out what you need to figure out, it's incredibly empowering. Yeah. So I think the most important thing is to take chances, calculated chances. I mean, if my children tried what I just described, I'd kill them. <laughs> But to take chances that put you outside your, uh, your comfort zone, within reason, um, that, um, that convince you 
that you can figure it out and, uh, and, and that also expose you to where your, your passions lie and where you, feel you can, um, where you feel you can contribute. And I think as I have done that in my career, I keep discovering where, not just where my passions lie, but where I feel my purpose is. It actually reminds me of the research showing that college appears to have a causal effect on students. It's obviously mm. impossible to completely separate out. Mm. Why is it that college would have a causal effect? Well, some of it is what you learn, mm. but it seems some of it is what you're describing, which is uh, it, to finish college, you have to figure out a kind of obstacle course to get through it yourself. And if you do that, particularly if you came from a background where that wasn't just natural, it, it empowers you to figure out other problems in life. This is a good one. Boston is one of the finalists for Amazon's HQ2. Uh, what would be your strategy as governor to attract or perhaps push, uh, meaning push away, Amazon HQ2 from Boston? I'm gonna, whose question is that? <laughs> Yours? Yeah? I, I, the re I'm not asking to call you. I, was just, it's, I feel it's more respectful to talk to you. Um, would you mind if I passed on that question? <laughs> <laughs> or, or talk to you off the record? And it's only because... There is a governor now, I'm not it, and I don't want to, and there's a mayor who's a part of it. I just don't want to get crosswise of them, um, and you know how these things are. I'll say something that isn't what they would have said, and then that'll turn into a thing at home. Um, so um, God bless them, um, but I, I, I'll stand right over here. And we can, are you from the media? Okay, so you, in which, <laughs> in which case, we won't talk, but uh, <laughs> if you, I'll stand right over here and we can talk about that afterwards if you don't mind. Okay? I am from the media, but I know you. <laughs> um, uh, That's why I'm not going to stand with you. <laughs> um, uh, Massachusetts is not a typical state, as one of our questions points out. Um, uh, whether it's its education infrastructure, it has a whole bunch of challenges, but it also has a whole bunch of advantages that other states don't. Um, given that, do you think there are place-based strategies that other states really need to emphasize um, that are different from Massachusetts? Mm. What are the big challenges uh, for other parts of the country um, that are different from Massachusetts? Well, so I think every state has its advantages. Um, you know, we, we play to our strengths. Our, I, I describe education as our na natural resource um, in the way that, you know, Corn is important in Iowa, and, and oil and gas is important in Texas. Um, and every state has a natural resource that um, uh, can and is cultivated. Uh, and, and it has a natural, well, so I, period. I also think um, there are certain uh, advantages that we as a uh, at, that we as a nation ought to claim and drive toward. Um, now, this will be a little controversial because I think in some ways we haven't really decided whether we want to be a nation. Um, but, um, you know, we are um, uniquely good historically at innovation. Um, to me, it's a, uh, it's a unique moment for innovation in the global economy. We ought to seize that. There's some things that make that unique strength um, durable, and they have to do with, um, with education and, and what we value in education, uh, meaning imagination and creativity. Uh, and so the notion of having a point of view about uh, high standards and high achievement nationally, um, uh, I think is a very important thing. Doesn't mean everybody has to do it the same way, but having a national point of view about, uh, about that, I think is really important. And I think, frankly, dealing with the fact that so much of our education policy, and, re and frequently so much of our economic and industrial policy is driven by nostalgia, we have to deal with that. I don't know how many conversations I had in, in office about, oh, you know, we've got to figure out how to make the schools the way they used to be right. when I was in school. And now we keep hearing about how, oh, I've got to figure out how to get that, that factory back. Instead of how do we imagine what tomorrow's going to be like that and drive toward that? You know, how do we, 
And so I think we've been really, really good about innovation. I think we have not been as good about transition. And that's the human part of it. We, we figure out how to clean up from the innovation after the innovations happen instead of how to make, how to bring everybody, not just bring everybody along, but frankly, make everybody a part of the innovation. You know, the innovators win and everybody else is a consequence. Well, there's a way to think about everybody being a part of the innovation. We've done it at least once in wartime. You know, we've had it as a national cause, but there's a way to think about, um, about seizing this innovation uh, uh, economy as our own and transition to it as a national uh, cause where, uh, where the economy grows out to everybody and not just up to a few, uh, uh, a few winners. So I do think there's a way to think about a national frame and themes um, uh, and strategy that then is tailored for local, um, uh, uh, for local differences and, and, local, um, uh, and local conditions. Yeah. We're almost out of time. There are a few questions in here about politics, and so I actually, think it's sound bites. I'm sorry. I, no, it's uh, this audience doesn't want sound bites. Uh, they do the, want their questions the, answered. I'm I, sorry. I want to kind of mesh a couple of them together um, and end on actually a political question, which I promise will not be whether you're running for president. Good. Um, uh, not today. There are obviously a lot of people despondent about the state of politics in this country, and I think a lot of people are particularly feeling that way this morning after yesterday. Um, what would you say to people about what some of the most important things we can do as a country are to get over this feeling that our institutions are coming apart at the seams, to get over this feeling of intense tribalism, that we are not, to quote you, perhaps even a nation? What, what would be your, your advice at this moment, um, both overall and maybe particularly for, for members of your own party? Well, uh I think we have good reason to be despondent. I mean, I see what everybody else sees. Um, I, didn't, I don't think we came here um, by accident um, or, or just in November of 2016. I think we've been drifting here for some while. I think in a democracy, you get the government you deserve. And, um, you know, we've, we've been, uh, we have accepted the lack of participation or the engineering of low participation for a long time. Uh, and I think the one good thing to have come of, uh, or one of the good things to have come from this moment, and there might be two actually um, in, in politics, is that there's a tremendous uh, energy yes. um, among lots of people who have come off the sidelines and gotten involved. And I, I, I guess I hope that that involvement is not just anger, but actually um, a, uh, a positive, uh, and I th I'm sensing it is, a willingness to think in ambitious ways about um, how to uh, reimagine our country um, and our systems and our, uh, and our solutions and not just accept uh, the way things are. Um, not just accept um, small solutions um, uh, or, or no solutions. Um, and I think that's exciting. I'm, you know, not everything that I hear, not all the rhetoric is um, uh, sensible or practical, but I have to believe that at the founding, lots of folks were saying some of those ideas don't seem very sensible or, or, uh, or, or, or practical, but um, the, the notion of ambitious, um, uh, positive, inclusive, kind-hearted uh, solutions that bring us all in and lift us all out, uh, all up, are um, very, very American and very, very patriotic. And I hope that candidates hear that. I hope my party um, uh, hears that, and I hope, uh, I, I, and I hope that makes a difference um, 
in November of this year and in cycles, um, in cycles going forward. We're supposed to be out of time, but I can't resist. You said there may be two positives. What's the second? Well, I'm blending the two. Um, I think, uh, I think the, the, amount of, the amount of energy is good, and I think the, the fact that there are ambitious, that folks are, are, are actually, I sense, the boldness of They're the interested yes. in big ideas and not just, you know, kind of tinkering around the, the, the margins. Maybe I'll just say this about, about my party. I, I really, and I touched on this, we're going to have to have more to say than a perfected critique of the other side. We're going to have to offer a positive alternative. And I hope that positive alternative is about an opportunity agenda, a reform agenda, and what I've been trying to figure out or kind of compose as a, as a democracy agenda, which is about making participation easier, um, less reliant on money, um, uh, more uh, about uh, an active uh, participation. And I frankly hope it will ultimately, I hope we can build some some uh, interest in, in uh, ways that we can get to know each other again. Because frankly, we don't know each other in this country uh, anymore. And maybe some um, emphasis on service again is, um, is important uh, in that respect. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jay Shamba. I'm the director of the Hamilton Project, and I'll be uh, moderating this uh, first panel here on the role of education in strengthening regions. Before we launch into the panel, I want to say a couple of quick thank yous. Um, first to uh, Krista McIntosh, our managing director, who is a huge partner in everything we do here, from content to the very last detail of getting these events to go off. And so I just want to thank her uh, for all she does, and also to Melanie Glarski, who's probably not even in the room because she's trying to make sure everything is running here. She's our events and outreach specialist, and it takes a lot to get one of these events to come off, and so I want to thank her. Um, also, hopefully you all got, when you walked in, uh, this book that we're releasing today, uh, Place-Based Policies for Shared Economic Growth. It's co-edited uh, by myself and Ryan Nunn, our policy director, who you'll hear from later. Um, so I just want to thank the entire team at the Hamilton Project. It is also a lot of work to put together a book. Um, and so I want to thank everyone there um, and just single out Jana Parsons, 
uh, who has been our point person on all things book uh, for the last few months, and uh, Becca Portman, who did all the design and layout and made sure this actually looks like a nice book uh, when we put all the work into it. Um, so just to very quickly set motivation for what we're going to try to talk about here, Jason covered some of this in his introduction, but just this idea that there are very stark gaps across the country. Um, we did some work in this uh, framing chapter for the book and looked kind of across the bottom 20% of counties and the top 20% of counties across a range of measures. As Jason mentioned, household income is literally half in the poorer counties what it is in the richer counties. The poverty rate is three times as high. Prime age, labor for, or prime age employment rates are 16 percentage points lower in the poorer performing counties. For anyone who's studied um, employment rates across this country, you know, we've Economists have been very, very worried and very, very focused about a slow decline in the prime age employment rate, especially amongst prime age males. Um, the fact that it's 16 percentage points different across places is just an incredibly large margin of that decline. Um, and when you add all these things up, you wind up with the life expectancy being six years shorter in the poorer performing counties compared to the better performing counties. And I think in some ways that the notion that your life is literally shorter brings into sharp relief the extent to which economic and life outcomes really are in many ways dependent on where you are, um, not just who you are. Um, as Jason also mentioned, these gaps aren't closing anymore. Um, so we've done some work in the book where we created this economic vitality index and tried to pull together a whole range of measures uh, to see how places are doing. And it's just no longer the case that there's much churn there. The places that were in the bottom in 1980 are still in the bottom. The places that were in the top are still in the top, by and large. Um, and that kind of calls into question this idea that, well, these things will sort themselves out. These gaps are there, but they're closing. They're just not closing anymore. And as mentioned, people aren't moving as much as they used to. And in particular, people aren't moving out of the weaker counties, we've found. And when they do move, almost somewhat surprisingly, they move to other weaker performing counties. You're not seeing people move towards opportunity to the same extent that they used to. Um, and so I think our motivation for holding this event and book and getting all these wonderful people to come talk to you about these issues is this idea that maybe this calls for a reexamination of place-based policies. Um, Mobility is important. Helping people to get to those better performing counties is important. But some, somehow it just felt like the answer of just move wasn't sufficient. And we had to think about what else we could maybe be doing. And when looking at this, one thing that, was very, that stood out quite a bit was the role of education. The strongest marker for being a poor performing county was a low high school graduation rate. The strongest marker for being a high performing county was a high share of your population with a bachelor's degree. And so we wanted to then kind of take that as a launching point for this conversation with this terrific panel to talk about the role of education in trying to help these struggling regions and the role of educational institutions as well. So we have a terrific panel. You have a program that gives their bios in detail, so I won't repeat all of it. I'll just introduce everyone. Um, starting from my left, we have Sean Cantor, who's an economics professor at Florida State University and who has done quite a bit of work studying how universities uh, can impact regional outcomes. Rebecca Blank is the chancellor of the University of Wisconsin right now. She is also a highly regarded economist who has studied poverty, labor, the social safety net, and also a former policymaker as the acting secretary of commerce and also a member of the Council of Economic Advisors. Louise Fox is the chief economist at USAID. Uh, she has worked in academia and at the World Bank studying poverty and inclusive growth. And then Stephen Smith, uh, is the Professor of Economics and International Affairs at George Washington University, where he studies economic development and poverty. Um, so, Sean, I want to start with you. So you co-authored one of the chapters in this book um, with Jason Barron and Alex Whaley, looking at how universities can play a role in helping struggling regions. So I just wonder if you could kind of kick things off by telling us about the proposal, kind of what motivated it, and, and how you were thinking about it. Sure. There's no doubt education's important. So if you just look at what's going on in the last 20, 30 years, more educated places are becoming increasingly wealthier relative to other places, as, as, you, as you point out. So um, at the same time, what role can universities play in, in educating a population? Well, when you look at the data, educational institutions are not a panacea. So for all these great places that we think about, Governor Patrick talked about the Boston area. That's a 
a gem in, you know, in our national collection of entrepreneurial ecosystems that are doing extraordinarily well, uh, Silicon Valley. But for each of those, I could name you another place that's not doing well. I, I live in one, so Tallahassee, Florida, or Gainesville, Florida, uh, two major flagship universities. These are not robust economies. So what can we do uh, thinking in terms of uh, place-based policies, to, uh, just say, let's plant a university here and magically make a place wealthier. Uh, just looking at the raw data, one becomes uh, rather skeptical. And so what we do in our proposal is we go through the various ways that universities uh, might matter. Um, one is they, what universities do, they, they teach students, they generate students. But the problem is more educated people are more likely to move than less educated people. So we talk a lot about mobility here. Um, so for the most part, you, for, for, for all of these places that might be generating lots of, um, lots of students, there's other places that don't have universities that are bringing all of these students in. So there's a lot of mobility going on at the higher end of the distribution, educational distribution. So thinking that we're just going to magically open up a university and uh, we're going to create this pool of students and businesses are going to come, um, unfortunately that's not going to work very well because people are mobile. And we've been, I won't get into the details, but there's examples just recently of communities making this argument. We're going to build a university, subsidize universities, because they're going to train students and then businesses are going to come. Well, we, we point out evidence that we're, we're fairly skeptical. Um, what universities can do, though, is create a demand for labor, um, create a, a situation where they become part of an ecosystem that is going to attract businesses and attract entrepreneurs. So we're more optimistic in that regard. So. Uh, the research that Alex Wally and I do show that when there is a university, they have a causal impact on the incomes of the non-education sector. So when you expand a university, and in particular expanding the research activities at a, of a university, people are going to end up doing better. You know, it, it, it raises their, their incomes. In particular, industries that are more closely tied to what universities do, like they use research in their input process, or they use technology that's created by universities, uh, they, th those, in, th those firms end up doing better when they're near a university. And there's something organic that goes on. It's not just universities creating ideas and then they get spun off. There's talks that go on, informal conversations. Uh, businesses that do manufacturing will talk to researchers and try to understand the state of the art. So it's a very informal uh, sort of mechanism that's happening as well. So how can we um, kind of leverage, leverage that? Uh, I think um, Chancellor Blank will talk about um, perhaps spin-offs that universities can do and how they can generate. But the, the thinking that I'm doing is something more informal. Uh, and so creating the, 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 the creating opportunity for universities to play a role in this agglomeration economy and the ecosystem that's going to make a place prosperous. Um, so what we propose in, in, in our paper that's in the, in the volume is an expansion of the manufacturing um, extension partnership that already exists. But the way the current program works, it's more of a demand base. So companies will come to a university and, and ask for help. And it's kind of like on a consulting basis. So it's really not a kind of this informal conversations that go on and something that, that, that it's going to happen organically. It's more, we have a problem, help us solve it. Uh, so what we, pr we, we propose in an expansion of, of, that, of, that, of that program that currently exists that's going to bring university researchers to these communities um, that might take advantage of some of the, um, the, the spillovers, knowledge spillovers that can take place that make businesses more, more productive. And what, what also, thinking back, I've done some work on agricultural extension as well. 
Uh, one of the interesting aspects of, of that program was that it not only brought the research out to farmers out on the frontier that was going on at the, at the flagship university, uh, but it also brought problems out from the frontier back to the researchers. So there was a, a two-way street in terms of the communication, understanding the problems that were going on, the scientific problems that were going on. So uh, we proposed that sort of thing uh, where you're embedding, let's say, graduate students or postdocs in businesses so they can communicate with manufacturers and try to bring state-of-the-art and translate state-of-the-art basic research that's going to add to the productivity of what these firms are doing, but then also bring back to researchers some of the problems that they're confronting, that manufacturers are say, <coughs> confronting. And just one final thing to say is that we, we all hear about the importance of data and data science and leveraging um, um, computers and, and, and the internet. Uh, so universities are really good at collecting data, analyzing data across disciplines. Uh, it's, it's, it's what we do. So taking advantage of, of that, I, we, we see that as low hanging fruit. And so just bringing researchers from a variety of disciplines and helping uh, businesses understand the data they have, asking questions and analyzing the data to help answer the questions we think is a real simple first step. Great, thank you. Um, so Becky, you've been an econ policymaker, kind of trying to figure out how to move the economy forward, but now you're also running a large university system. And so you were kind of our dream person to think about this topic broadly and, and this proposal more specifically. And so I'm just curious how, as someone running a large university system, how you see what role a university can play in trying to help struggling regions and, and move the economy forward. So um, I'm a big believer, and I'm admittedly a biased resource on this, that uh, research universities in particular are absolutely essential for long-term economic growth in this country at the macro level. Just to, you know, They do two things that are absolutely essential. They are the source of skilled labor, and they are the source of innovation and new ideas in basic science. So at a regional level, um, a, obviously a research university brings both of those things to the region and that helps. They do a third thing, which is not unimportant, is they bring a whole bunch of resources in that wouldn't be there otherwise. So at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, we bring in about $1.4 billion a year, which is simply the research dollars, that's about $1.1 billion, plus out-of-state tuition. Uh, it's another three, 350000 And we spend that all in the region. And that, you know, in, in a place like Madison and Wisconsin, that's not an insignificant amount. Now, we sort of do those things just by doing our job. The question is, what else should we be doing to generate economic growth? And let me suggest a few things. Um, clearly, there's the um, um, trying to smooth the path to business growth. And um, I'm not saying that you, you know, this is something that you know, may or may not happen. It's something that universities proactively need to be doing and working on. Research partnerships, which Sean talks about, um, are absolutely essential, um, particularly as private business does less and less basic research. They need correlations with researchers and want to be in the labs and you know, scanning what's happening out there and taking good ideas back into the company for commercialization. And you've got to work to make research partnerships work. Secondly, entrepreneurship programs. We have five certificate or degree programs on entrepreneurship. The interest in this has never been higher. Um, our estimate is there are about 360 businesses in Wisconsin that came out of the university that are new startups and using technologies from the university right now. And if you looked at the ones that came out of the university and didn't stay in Wisconsin, you'd have um, a substantially larger number. And that's important for economic growth. And then thirdly, of course, you've got to link businesses with your um, uh, w with your students, um, whether that's through internships, whether that's through bringing them in so students get to know them. You know, Wisconsin has this problem that we have the Twin Cities in Chicago sitting right on our borders, and those are huge draws for students, right? And you want to keep students in the state. And we're doing a number of things consciously with some of the big employers in the state to make sure that students have connections with them while they're in school so that we have, for instance, increased the share of students from out of state who stay in the state. And we're now at 20% of our out of state students staying. Now, you may say that's not a very high number, but realize we're a big university. That's 800 new graduates, highly skilled, well-trained a year, who are staying in the state every year um, 
and that adds up over time, um, who came here for school and probably wouldn't have been here otherwise. Now, last comment. That's all about generating economic growth. You also have to ask what's the responsibility of the university for particularly bringing along lower income populations. And um, there, again, universities have to be proactive, and particularly the publics, where part of our mission is outreach to the state and to the community and access. So um, being involved in partnerships and pipeline programs with K-12 is important. Working with your um, two-year schools across the state, we have automatic transfer agreements that if people do certain things in two-year college, they don't even have to apply to UW-Madison. They can come automatically. And then the scholarship side of this is important. And I, I think one of the really important things here is simple messaging that makes it easy for students and families who don't know much about college to have a sense of the possibility. Um, so one thing, I'll end with an example. One thing we announced last spring is something we call Bucky's Tuition Promise. Bucky Badger is our mascot. Bucky and I do a lot of events together. Um, <laughs> and um, Bucky's Tuition Promise essentially is a statement, and we work to get the funding together for this, that if you are in the bottom half of the income distribution in the state of Wisconsin, that means you're from a family whose income is less than $56,000, um, that we will guarantee that if you get admitted into UW-Madison, we will give you the scholarship aid to cover four years of your tuition and fees. Now, you still have to pay living expenses, dorm expenses. That's not insignificant. But that message has enormous resonance. It says, we're going to make it as easy for you as possible. And of course, some people will get more aid than that. Um, and you know, it's a statement that you can afford to come and we'll work with you. And you know, we, we, our biggest problem with this is we tell people about this and they don't believe us. Um, but um, doing that type of very conscious and explicit outreach, I think, is deeply important if universities are going to be part of the um, economic growth um, issues in, in a region and in a state. Great, thanks. Um, before I move on to the next question, I just want to remind people that we've got people walking around with question and answer cards, so they'll pass those up to me and I'll, I'll ask those a little later on. Um, Stephen, I want to come to you next. So we asked you to do something a little unusual for our proposals here, um, which was to actually kind of look across a very wide literature and think about what we could learn. Um, and so in a sense, what can we, when we're thinking about struggling regions in the United States, what can we learn from the development economics literature where there's a lot of terrific evidence that people have been accumulating over the last couple of decades? Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about the proposal, in particular, kind of the, the parts of it where you focused on the education side. So people should read the whole thing. It's in the book, um, but because there's a lot of great literature summarized there. But in particular, how you thought about what the literature told us about how we should be thinking about education policy. Right, okay, well, thank you. Well, first of all, I think that the chapter gives some good news that enormous progress has been made in a number of areas. Education is certainly one of them across what we call the developing world, which is low income, lower middle income, and upper middle income countries. And of course, in those countries, we're thinking a lot less about getting kids into and graduating from college, and much more in getting kids to enroll, continuously enroll, and complete through high school in many cases. So that's the focus that I give most to uh, with respect to education. Um, in fact, if you look at the US data, we find that there are many kids who are not graduating from high school. The data uh, are different depending upon which data series you're looking at. They're very different across states, but it's very common and much more common than in other rich countries for kids not even to finish um, um, high school. So with that in mind, I sifted through the evidence from development economics to see what there was good evidence for that suggested if we take these policies and these approaches, we can keep kids in school for longer and um, get them to graduate and to understand what the effects might be of doing so, so we know how worthwhile that this might be. Um, certainly, you know, among the OECD countries, we are one of those that does uh, the least well at graduating um, kids from, um, from high school. Mm -hmm. So there were four approaches that were taken in developing countries that, first of all, led to some success within education, but also had other benefits for those kids outside of school attainment. 
And this is, of course, foundational because if we're going to transform lagging regions, we have to first think about building up the human capital, the skills, the education, the health, and so on of the rising generation of people in those lagging counties, inner cities, and um, elsewhere. But those included extending the age, the minimum age at which you could uh, leave school, um, introducing programs to provide better information for families as well as for students of what the benefits were of getting more education, staying in school, um, graduating, um, special targeted tutoring for students who were lagging um, and falling behind on their grade level, including activities that can take place uh, within the school itself, and finally, financial incentives for, uh, some, in some cases, the students typically for their parents as they meet goals of staying in school longer and perhaps a bonus by actually graduating. So for all of these approaches, there is rigorous economic evidence using different methods as appropriate to the problem and the potential for doing research from randomized controlled trials, um, in many cases, to a variety of natural experiments that show that these interventions really can work to get kids to stay in school and to get them to form better in school and to graduate. And they also have uh, shown that there are a lot of other very important benefits, economic benefits like higher income, but also many social benefits, ranging from being more likely to get married, have a family, um, have uh, greater happiness over your lifespan, um, have longer lifespans, um, stay out of prison. A whole range of social indicators were also positively affected by each of those four areas. So I want to emphasize, of course, that developing countries, even upper middle income developing countries, are different from conditions found here. And so these are ideas that come from the literature where there's strong evidence that things have worked well that we would have to try and experiment with and learn about implementation here, just as these things are tried in different contexts in developing countries. On the other hand, many of these countries are about where we were in, say, 1960, for example, a little bit earlier or a little bit more recent. So I think we can learn a lot. It's inspiring to look at programs that have been tried and seen what dramatic success they've had. So the proposal is to look at all of these four areas as policy interventions that might be effective here. Again, not that these things are not talked about here, but we can learn a lot um, from this. Um, just one final um, additional point. The next uh, section of the chapter looks at what's worked in the area of uh, nutrition and physical health, mental health, and so on. And good health and good nutrition is also foundational from the beginning of a child's life to performing well uh, throughout school. So that's, a, that's where we went with that. Great. Thanks. Um, so, Louise, you've kind of both studied and helped shape policy in um, in developing countries. And so I'm curious about your take on, on where Stephen's proposals are coming from and also kind of how you've seen developing countries try to respond to the same challenge of lifting educational outcomes in regions that are struggling. Sure, great. First of all, I should say that um, uh, my agency, USAID, has no role in domestic policy. So I'm not speaking uh, for my agency. I'm really here in a personal uh, capacity. Now, um, you know, as Stephen has noted, uh, and as many of you know, developing countries do care a lot about lagging regions um, for a number of reasons um, that are, uh, some are similar to the U.S., some are not. Um, they're worried about the fact that there can be ethnic, um, uh, uh, there could these can be a focus of an, a particular ethnic group in a can be associated with a lagging region, um, a mountainous area, and believe it or not, mountainous areas are correlated with terrorism. So um, there are a lot of complex domestic. Um, political reasons why developing countries are interested in doing something about lagging regions, but the big difference is they're mostly rural, right? So. China is really the only developing country I can think of that has a Rust Belt problem uh, within northeastern China. Um, 
Now, one of the things they're, the lagging regions are all trying to do, and they're looking uh, for a better education system to help them with, is sending their children to the cities to get a better job. And so that mobility, that much greater mobility, I think shapes some of the education uh, debate. Having said that, many stay there. And one of the programs that Steve talks about, which is maybe the anti-poverty and educational um, development program most well known in the US is the Progressive Program, which was piloted in uh, southern Mexico, Chiapas region, which is a very poor uh, region, really a lagging region. Now, this rural-urban gap in educational attainment is huge. It's on average a 2.5 grades, um, and I'm talking about basic education. Um, so that's, and it's even more in the lowest income countries. And so um, just trying to get more kids in school uh, through some of the measures um, that Steve's discussed um, is important. Um, but I would also say um, donors, and I would put USAID in that category, are increasingly focused on quality. So what we know, thanks to a new data set um, from the World Bank uh, that the USAID contributed to, is actually that the test scores between rural and urban areas in developing countries, um, the gap is about 12% on average. And again, it's actually worse in sort of the lower middle income countries, the countries that have been able to expand education and improve quality in urban areas, but not in rural areas. Now, so there's been a kind of a debate about how much focus we should have on things like uh, the measures that Steve discussed about getting kids in school if the schools aren't very good in the first place. So I think um, there is an increased focus on the quality of schools and trying to um, reduce the number of unqualified teachers um, and also the poor pedagogy practices. And finally, an area uh, where there's a lot of focus in developing countries, which I do think is similar to developed countries and to the US, is there's starting to be a focus on school management and effective uh, principles. Now, what are the tools for raising school quality? I have to say there's certainly a big debate in the US about assessment, and I'm totally unqualified to comment on that. <laughs> But uh, at, uh, certainly donors, uh, USAID included, really think that if we're not doing early grade assessment of reading skills, um, we're really failing students. And so there's uh, a number of donors, USAID, the World Bank, DFID, a number of donors are really focusing much more on using assessment, that means tests, um, as a measure of whether the schools are really uh, teaching anything. Great, thanks. Um, before we move on, Stephen, I want to come back to you just for a second to talk about a different aspect of your uh, chapter. You talk a lot about what we've learned in developing countries about the cost of poverty and how we have to think about that when we kind of make policy to try to help regions where there, where there really is a lot of concentrated poverty. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So one thing that development economics has focused on much more in recent years is the area of behavioral economics. And so there's been a lot of focus on problems of the poor and how they're related to how those conditions affect them, for example, cognitively. So that some of the findings are really quite striking. So that um, for you know, people who are quite smart, Quite, have quite normal intelligence, stresses on them will actually lead to lower measurable intelligence scores, sometimes significantly. And this has something to do with cognitive tax, as behavioral econ economists sometimes call it. In particular, often if you don't know where your next meal is coming from or how you're going to feed your family in the short run or you're hungry, uh, as many of the poor also here apparently are, then you're inevitably and unavoidably going to be focused on food. And this is going to make it difficult for you to take other steps to get out of poverty. Similarly, if you don't know how you're possibly going to pay the loan that's coming due for you, or if you have bills that are piling up, the question is, how do I get enough money to do this to pay the rent? Who do I borrow money from to deal with this problem, to you know, address that, and how will I pay them back? These things become um, inevitably 
problems that you're obsessed with. And it makes it very difficult under those conditions to take other steps that would be helpful to get out of poverty, even to get off public assistance. So to the extent that programs also here in the US can learn from this new information, these new findings about what we can do in response to these problems, that would be potentially very helpful. We need to experiment in those areas. And just a very simple illustration is to simplify forms oh, yeah. as much as possible, <laughs> to make it as easy as possible to, to enroll, um, to, uh, if you have trouble remembering, for example, to enroll your children, uh, let automatic enrollment take place. Um, just keep in mind these findings. And I think this is one area that has gotten a lot of attention in development economics and perhaps much less in the U.S. policy literature. Thanks. So. Becky, I'd like to come to you on, on this point, less in your role of running university and more your career as someone who has studied poverty in the United States in, in great detail. Um, and just think about your views on this kind of specific issue of how do we need to think about places and people struggling with extreme poverty when we try to think about the policies we, we might be using to help them. Yeah. And if you read Stephen's paper, I mean, it, it goes through lots of policies and shows that there is evidence for lots of policies making a difference. And of course, the real problem becomes, where do you start and what do you do in a world of limited resources and limited energy? And um, you know, the answer to that has to be empirical, but that's a hard answer to come by. My, my gut answer is it's education, health, and working on some basic income support, um, and you've got to start there. But you know that's that's a debatable point, and um, you know people can show me evidence that says otherwise. Um, I think one of the one of the things that I would say, and this was a question that the governor got, and I, I thought didn't quite answer, um, is do you tell people to leave who have opportunities elsewhere? And I will say I think it is very difficult to look in the face of someone who has an opportunity to get out of a very poor area and say, don't leave because they need you here. I mean, that has to be a choice that someone makes. And in many cases, getting out is important. And of course, that then only adds to the problems of mm -hmm. the area itself when you have the um, you know, people with more opportunities leaving quickly. And so it's one of the real conundrums here is um, how do you make this a place that people want to stay at and work on at the same time that um, for some number of people, leaving is the right answer. Um, and you know, most low-income neighborhoods don't want to think about that particular problem. Interesting. Um, on, on that note of, of beyond education, how we're thinking about struggling regions, Louise, I know you've mentioned that you know, this is obviously an issue that developing countries care a lot about for some of the reasons you mentioned about political instability and, and issues around that. So beyond education, what are, what are some of the steps you've seen them taking that you think are either successful and or maybe lessons that the US could be thinking about? in terms of trying to help the regions that are struggling more? So um, uh, one issue, well, OK, first of all, I, I, I thought it was interesting that the governor ducked the question on, on Amazon, because I think, um, actually, uh, developing countries have a lot of failure in this area. Um, I would say the least successful policy to combat spatial inequality has to be to move the capital. So when you move it from Lagos to Abuja, it doesn't necessarily combat spatial inequality. And there are a lot of countries doing that, and even Indonesia's thinking about it now, uh, too. And so that's my least favorite. Also fairly unsuccessful has been industrial zones in rural areas or near rural areas, the idea being to move the rural economy away from agriculture. The rural economy will move away from agriculture automatically, especially as agriculture becomes more commercial, more productive, higher value, um, and more mechanized. And meanwhile, these zones are far from the port and logistics and the clusters, and they have not solved the fundamental problems of the business environment. Now, I think Governor Patrick did talk about transport investments. And the externalities, low-income countries, we're really, really understanding much better the externalities of transport infrastructure in terms of facilitating flows of information and people as well as goods. So it's not just that um, uh, uh, building a road um, then gets uh, helps 
young people migrate to the city, it, they then go back home more often and bring uh, new ideas and new approaches. And other people who stay have better linkages. And it also reduces uh, the cost of moving goods and services um, as well. But I would say um, there's one area where um, I'm going to be very interested to listen to the next panel um, on the geography of segregation. Uh, you do have that pro growing problem in low-income country cities. Um, and I think about it, that especially in terms of South Africa, uh, where the main reason people can't get a job is they actually don't live close enough to the job. And so it would cost too much for them to get to the job. So I think um, that's an area where I'm going to be interested mm -hmm. to listen. Great. Thanks. Um, Sean, I want to come back to you on one point, which is you, you have kind of this fascinating experience given what you study. And I think, as you've said, it shaped what you study in some sense of of where you worked at one point. And so just to remind people, when we sometimes think about, well, people say, well, we just need more research universities because that would be great. That would help these struggling places. As people who run universities now have some pointed, sometimes pointed out to me, you know, that's great. We don't even fund the ones we have. Where exactly are you getting the money to drop these new research universities? But that said, there is an example of one happening in the last couple decades. University of Merced kind of dropped in the middle of a struggling region when California decided to create another research university. And you were there, uh, right. kind of on the ground floor. And so I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about that, what you learned from it, in particular about how it shaped your ideas about what are the conditions you need for a university to be able to help the region that has been placed. Yeah, I, I was in this interesting exper experiment. So uh, California decided in the 1980s that it was facing a, a student population boom coming in about 15 years. So they were settle, settling to get a new campus built. Um, and so I don't, if, if you know anything about the Central Valley of California, it's extraordinarily poor region, probably the, some of the poorest counties in the country. So with very low um, college going rates, pretty much all agricultural, uh, not, not much else going on. So um, they decided to put this university in the Central Valley and the goal was to, at least looking at the public relations uh, releases that were coming out to fundamentally transform the Central Valley, getting uh, students, high school graduates, well, first of all, get them to graduate from high school and then go on to college. Um, and then to uh, be this attractive magnet that's going to bring all these new businesses to this, uh, this poor area. So um, I ended up there in 2004. There, there was nothing, no students, no buildings, no nothing. We were, we were just building the thing from, from, from the ground up, literally. And so a crazy thing happened along the way. Well, first of all, most of our students were coming from outside the Central Valley. Mm -hmm. We had equal numbers coming from the Bay Area, uh, San Diego area, LA area. Very small amount coming from the Central Valley. And it's still the case today. You know, it's um, you know more than fi more than almost 15 years later, same situation today. And um, another thing that's happening is that there's students graduate. There's no opportunities for them in Merced or in in the nearby region. So they have to go back home or or the the other um, you know, stronger economic regions in California, the Bay Area or or, or Southern California. Um, so what I observed, what, this is what got me interested in thinking about um, research universities as sort of this uh, creator of, of economic wealth is this was supposed to happen at Merced. And um, the big problem was that you plant this university there. As, as I talked about beforehand, students can just move. They, they came from out of the region. They left. They, they're leaving. to go. They're going out of the region. So it's not really helping in that regard. And then also in terms of the businesses, you know, so students have no incentive to stay in, in the region because there's no opportunity. And then at the same time, businesses aren't going to come um, because th there's no agglomeration forces. There are no ecosystem for them uh, that they're attracted to. And it's the, not, the university itself is not this panacea. So you know, I, I think in terms of knowledge spillovers, and that's, how, that's kind of what motivates my work. So, you, the university's doing all this work, but there's nobody there to accept it in the local area. 
and there's nobody in the local area for the university researchers to learn from. So you have all this stuff going on in the university, but it's just going on in the university. Uh, so just one, one small little point is, is, uh, is Governor uh, Patrick talked about um, Massachusetts and, and, um, and, and the Boston area. So back during the early land grant days uh, in the 1860s, Massachusetts, I think, pretty much is the only state that did a really interesting thing, is that they set up their uh, manufacturing aspect of the land grant piece of their university system in Boston, that's MIT, and they did the agricultural part where agriculture is going on out in Amherst. So Massachusetts did it right really early on, is that you had businesses there that needed this new knowledge that was going to be created and that could, uh, that could actually absorb it productively and also feed back to the researchers, and then the agriculture was going on in the western part of the state. So from my perspective, Massachusetts got it right very early on, and that did not happen um, in California. So Merced was created for political reasons in the Central Valley, but in terms of let's build a university and they will come, it's just not working Interesting. yet. Um, great. So I'd like to turn to the, uh, some of the questions. We've gotten some great questions here. And so I'll, I'll pitch these kind of to one person, but other panelists should hop in if they have additional thoughts. I'd also like to just mention, if you feel like it's a little warm in here, you're right. Um, the air conditioning is apparently broken, so we apologize for that. But if you're wondering if it's just you, the answer is it's not just you. Uh, it is the room. Um, so um, one of the things I've noticed in flipping through here, we got more than one question on the same general topic, which maybe isn't surprising because we've been talking on the one hand about universities and on the other hand about high school completion. And so then we got a bunch of questions about what's in between. Um, and thinking both about policies aimed at better training, getting people kind of maybe assuming they have a high school degree, but what else do they need to get into the workforce after that? And then also, what can universities do if it is short of their normal accepting students and not just working with business, but how can they help on the training side and making sure those businesses have the workers they actually want? Becky, I don't know if you want to think about that last piece of it. Well, I think it's where systems start mattering because you actually want real correlations between your high schools, your two-year schools, your, 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 your um, comprehensive sort of four-year schools and your universities. And you want to create as much flow across those as possible and as much of a sense of possibility for an awful lot of low-income students. Thinking about going to a four-year research university just isn't in the realm of possibility. They might think about living at home and going to a two-year certificate or someplace else. And once they get there, you want them to get a sense of possibility of, gosh, if you do this well, you could go on and do more. And, and you've got to have connections all the way through that make it easy to do that and that pull people in. And that takes really conscious effort and work. And Stephen, I don't know, in, in your work, I think you did look some about these ideas of are there ways we can be doing better with training and, and kind of recognizing that not everyone is making it through all the way to a university. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Are there kind of examples you saw from the development literature that you thought were promising or worth noting? Yeah, so again, um, you know, government, uh, Governor Patrick pointed out that there were opportunities there in the research hospitals and you needed some certificate, if not an associate's degree, to be able to do so. And his bottom line is that students had to graduate from high school. So that if you look at the lagging areas, um, struggling areas, you see a much higher concentration of students who have not yet, who've, who've simply not graduated from high school have dropped out. So I, I simply think this is really foundational if you want to reach the poorest in these areas and really bring off the level, especially for people less able to migrate out as we have been talking about. So interestingly, I had thought about doing a section on the literature showing that training in developing countries had strong impacts and instead found that that evidence is more ambiguous. Less studies have been done, but the studies that are there are less convincing than these other areas that I talk about throughout the, uh, throughout the paper. And um, Dr. Fox has done outstanding literature reviews on this very 
uh, question and brought many of those studies together, which uh, unfortunately reach a somewhat similar conclusion. Um, one thing that I do suggest in the paper that is worth exploring is more connections between the private sector in these areas and those who are uh, still in high school but are at risk. It can take the form, for example, of offering a job if you complete high school. And that can be very relevant in some of these areas where there is actually pretty high demand at this moment in time, at least, for people who, um, who have finished high school, but not earlier. So I think that's really worth doing. Um, and, and, and one other um, nuance I'd like to emphasize, sometimes in these data we're talking about uh, regions within developing countries. Often these studies are economy-wide, or at least they're programs that have been rolled out economy-wide. So in this regard, if the country as a whole is at, say, US 1960 um, level, and if in urban areas there is great disparity in terms of kids staying in school or not, I think we can learn not just from the, from the uh, specific regional place-based areas in developing countries, but sometimes learn from those uh, countries as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I would uh, I'd leave it at that for the moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Luis, do you wanna, is there anything you want to add on the, the studies that, that you've seen or worked on, on thinking about how training you know, beyond the high school education but short of the university can be, have impacts or not? So the latest study I read, which wasn't in my paper that Steve cited, was done by Carolyn Kraft at, um, in Minnesota, University of Minnesota, and she shows that in Egypt, people are actually earn more money if they don't go to technical, <laughs> vocational and technical education. Um, uh, now, that is really a statement about the quality of these programs. And there, there's a huge gap uh, with the US in that um, there isn't, uh, throughout the school system, including higher education, there isn't enough integration with the private sector and with employers. And that means that students leave school really completely uh, unprepared for the, um, for the world of work. Now, I think what Steve was talking about, um, you know, there, is a, there are some experimental programs going on in South Africa where employers are starting to work in the high schools at the junior uh, level and the senior level to find kids, support kids, and help them both stay in school and have summer jobs um, in, the, in the private sector. And it may be that um, in some uh, urban areas um, in the US where it's still difficult to connect people that uh, finish education with, um, with the opportunities, uh, there may be things to learn there. A, a quick comment, if you're gonna run a pipeline program, you don't wanna start it for juniors and seniors in high school, you've gotta start it in middle school because by the time they're juniors or seniors, they're at a point where they're not going to be able to go on in many cases because they just made choices that you know, they've dropped out essentially. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that uh, you need, that the whole career orientation that exists in American schools about you know, field trips aren't just to museums, sometimes they're to factories and mm -hmm. having people come in and talk about what they do at work and things like that just I mean, this is unheard of in Africa, unheard of. And when I cite, um, you know, the idea that a teenager might, who might have a summer job in fast food, even though they intend to go on to college and get all kinds of degrees, this is unheard of uh, in Africa. So, um, you know, the U.S. from that point of view, I think the U.S. culture that emphasizes that kind of stuff uh, should be celebrated. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of questions here that I, I want I think are probably aimed for, for Sean and Becky, which is um, the, some emphasis so far in the discussion on how the universities are going to help the firms in the area, mm -hmm. right? And try to think of that as trying to you know, create the demand for the high school workers, as you say, and things like that. So one of the questions was, beyond what the professors and researchers are doing at universities, what can the students do? Um, when, you've got stu when you've got large universities in areas that are often struggling, are there ways the students there can be, in some sense, used to help the, the region around them better? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I do think that you know, there, you, one wants to do a number of things inside a university, and classroom learning is only part of it. 
Um, it's one reason you want people to go do study abroad. It's one reason you want them to do internships. But you also want them to do what I think of as citizenship activities. And um, so we have, for instance, very, very, and most schools do very large volunteer activities. And um, you know, try to use some of our students in our pipeline programs, use them in tutoring programs. You know, yes, they do a lot of things that aren't involved with the K-12 schools. But um, you know, particularly for our first-gen students and our lower-income students, whether from rural areas or students of color, they often um, find it very satisfying to have an opportunity to go back and act as a mentor to mm -hmm. younger people. So you know, we try very consciously to set those opportunities up. Sean, anything? As, as, as Chancellor uh, Blank pointed out, uh, students are really interested in entrepreneurship. So there's that, there's that pent up demand among the students to be involved in these sort of um, activities. So the problem is that so they might come up with an idea, not to, not to be overly pessimistic right, here, right. so they come up with an idea, um, but the problem that they're going to face in these, let's, let's say they happen to be in a region that's lagging behind that we're talking about, the ecosystem isn't there for them to be a successful entrepreneur. So the venture capital is not there, perhaps the skilled labor force that they need, um, the specific technologies they need aren't going to be in this random location that we're talking about. Uh, so I'll just throw out a hypothetical question. I don't even know if this is the role of universities, but perhaps they could do something not just fostering this initial enthusiasm among the students, which universities seem to be doing really well right now, but can they create a system, an ecosystem for the students beyond where that, they, that something can get rooted and then these new businesses, startups will stay? And you know, I think the chancellor can probably answer that better than I can. Yeah. Now, the answer is obviously yes, but it has to be done with the larger environment, with the venture capitalists, which the, with the businesses, with the people who want to do mentoring. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's the early, think about an idea and how it might be commercialized, you can do on campus. But the actual moving to a prototype and moving out in, you know, to build a business, you've got to do off campus. And um, so, so you, you've got to do this in really close collaboration with the people around you and the, the environment you're in. Um, yeah. I want to ask a, a last question of really everyone, and I'll, I'll do the thing you're never supposed to do, which is I'll ask you a question I have no idea how any of you are actually going to answer. Um, so I know lawyers are never supposed to do that. I'm not a lawyer uh, and don't play one on TV. But um, I'll, so I'll ask it of all of you in a sense, which is how worried are you when we think broadly about ways to help regions that are struggling, whether it's through trying to improve educational outcomes, using universities, other ways, how much do you worry about the last issue that Jason raised, which is that as much as we could get this whole group mm -hmm. together and we could spend all day and we could design a set of policies that we would even think there is a strong evidence base for, for how it would help and even find the funding for them and all, all of this, um, that by the time it gets through the process that makes policy, um, since many of you have worked in the policy making world, uh, that it won't look enough like what we wanted to design here, that it actually won't be very productive, and that the challenge of place-based policies is the policy part more than the place-based part. And how much do you worry about that? Or do you think there really are examples and opportunities where, no, we could get this right, and we could do things that are productive? Um, I'll start from the far end. Stephen, okay. you want to hop in? Sure. So um, I think that there are several policies that we can carry out that primarily encourage people to use ex um, mandates that are already there, um, infrastructure that's already there. So all schools are required to educate kids, often to age 20 and so on. So that if we can use these different approaches, like raising the minimum age, giving better information, uh, different kinds of incentives, tutoring, then we're not asking specifically for new policies beyond that because we have schools in place, for example. Now, I couldn't agree more about the importance of raising quality. That's a problem really everywhere in the world. But enrollment and completion is certainly a place to start. Quality is hard to measure. In developing countries, the evidence that I've described has to do with staying in school and completing school there even though quality may not be great. And another um, approach, since again, I was um, arguing that really foundational to all of what we're talking about is 
um, helping the rising generation to reach their potential so that they can help their uh, regions. Again, health and nutrition for the young is very, very important through high school. And we talk a lot in terms of policy about the potential need to expand the expanded Medicare or um, have programs that have wide, wider reach. But what I talk about in the paper um, is that there's things we can do to motivate people to take advantage of the existing programs we have, like SNAP, you know, formerly food stamps, um, WIC, CHIP um, in terms of uh, insurance, and of course, uh, Medicaid. Um, in states, whether expanded or not, the evidence is that there are millions of people eligible from these programs whose families could greatly benefit from them that are not taking advantage of these programs. So these are existing mandates. Um, and so there's a variety of things that you can do to encourage people to take advantage of these um, programs. I come back to the case of Progresa in Mexico, um, event which became a countrywide um, program, just as they had financial incentives and other incentives for parents to keep the kids in school, they also have strong incentives for families to take advantage of existing health services in that country. And the evidence it has been very clear that that has raised health and nutrition conditions in those areas. So um, even with existing policies and existing mandates, we can take modest and rather cost-effective approaches to get good results. And that's basically my take on, on the literature from developing countries anyway. Okay, Luis? So I guess part of the problem is there's policy and however the law is written and then there's implementation and that's uh, often uh, where the gap is. And I think, um, you know, I was taught as an economist that everything's all about money. And now economists have this subject called behavioral economics, which the psychologists think we just stole from them and rebranded, and maybe they're right, which says that it's not all about money. <laughs> and I'm thinking about an experiment that was done um, in the U.S., possibly in Massachusetts, where uh, some teachers got um, a bonus if their kids did well on test scores or graduated or whatever, and some teachers got and training to learn to teach better. And then, and, the, and then there was, of course, the control group. And the, the second approach worked much better than the first approach. And it turns out that actually people want to do their job and they want to do it better. And so uh, maybe it's kind of the implementation of our education mandate where we're not figuring out how to help teachers and principals do their job better. Um, and maybe we need to be doing more of that. And that's certainly um, uh, the, the issue of school-based management, school management and effective principals is something that's really being discussed right now um, in Latin America a lot. Great, thanks. Becky? So uh, like Jason, I'm a little skeptical of place-based policies. We haven't talked at all about the very large number of efforts that all evidence suggests did nothing. Um, and you can go through almost every administration of enterprise zones and economic development zones, and the research on that just says these, you know, maybe we didn't put enough money into them, but these weren't very effective, and that makes me skeptical. On the other hand, I think the politics of this, you know, all politics is local. We are going to do place-based policy and we're gonna talk about it, so we ought to figure out, given we're gonna spend some money on it, how to do it well. The one thing I think we haven't talked about on this panel um, is we've been talking about policy, and I will say, having, when I was at Commerce, I visited a number of places that had been very successful economic growth stories, and the one thing that struck me in all of those places was not just that they did good policy and were smart, but they had a group of people across every domain, business, K-12, two-year schools, four-year schools, state, county, government, that sat around the table together and talked and really communicated well, and that in that group, there are three or four very, very effective leaders. And um, that type of leadership and communication and working well together meant that they could take opportunities that might have been out there for every community 
um, and really mobilize them for their community. And in that sense, it, I, I think to do this effectively does require a lot more than just putting a policy on the table. Sean? Yeah, so implicitly in our proposal, we were thinking exactly this. So our message to policymakers is please don't spend a billion dollars or more on building a new university. It's really not going to do the trick. Um, and so we just thought about practical ways that uh, you can have some cost-effective means of helping a local community that might otherwise want some kind of grand place-based policy. So um, getting a university involved, as you, as you said, it's, it's part of a partnership, it's part of a team, and so expanding on the current program, the MEP that already exists, that seems to be, in our minds, a reasonable first step toward let's seeing if something can work with regard to universities. But please don't spend a billion dollars or more building a new one. Um, as the chancellor can attest, state universities and colleges are struggling as it is financially anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Um, we're actually going to ask one more quick round of questions. There, this being Brookings, there's always lots of things going on, and there's a head of state that's going to be moving shortly, and so we're not supposed to all flood out into the hall right as they're moving. So uh, I'm going to take opportunity to then ask, while we have this great panel assembled, to ask one other set of questions that came out of the note cards. There were terrific questions in here. Thank you. Which is, one of the things we didn't really talk too much about is federal <laughs> policy here. So we talked a lot about what universities could be doing. Um, we talked a lot about local state, uh, local school systems and things like this. So, um, and maybe starting with Becky and then Sean, since your proposal is in some sense a way to partner with the federal government, you could flesh out how you see that happening. But what, what could you as a head of a university system use more of from the federal government <laughs> to try, not just for all of your goals, but for this specific set of goals of how the university can help the region around it? Golly. So um, from the university point of view, I, I think this is the, uh, the question of how do we make sure we provide access to low-income students. And um, this is not the place to go into a whole list of things of how do you change the student loan program, how do you change the FAFSA form, you know, how, how should we be running Pell Grants. Um, those are really important questions. And particularly if you talk about issues of how do you fill out forms, I must say, the difficulties we create for people to receive you know, what is, you know, basically federal aid that large numbers of students should be getting, but is very, very hard for often for their families to access. Um, so, you know, providing much greater simplification and um, making it easier to access that set of programs and for us to work with that set of students. Great. Sean, do you want to describe a little bit more detail how you see the federal government partnering with universities in this, in this proposal? Yeah, so in, in our proposals about research universities and uh, my, my work thinks about research universities, uh, not necessarily um, state colleges that, are, uh, that, that aren't engaged necessarily in the research enterprise or community colleges. So just wanted to um, mention that first. And what research universities faculty are good at is, is basic research. And, um, and, and you know, importantly, being being close to the research enterprise is valuable, but um, it's valuable in its own right. Um, and so I think the and and that has broader implications for the national economy. Um, and 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 so in 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 that regard, uh, it's going to help everybody. That let's say ideas that are created at um, MIT or Harvard, for example, can easily be translated at at Stanford and help the, the Silicon Valley economy or you know where I live in, in, in Tallahassee. So I think from a from a to the extent that states are worried about the knowledge that's created locally spilling over and, and worried about investing in knowledge that they might not be able to capture the benefits, perhaps the federal government can play that role. And we and the federal government does play that role now. Um, but to the extent that states want to think about trying to capture some of the knowledge and helping the local community, that might be more of a statewide um, um, activity that currently the federal government subsidizes some of that, but um, not on a grand scale. Uh, we, we, to the extent that the federal government wants to help regions around the country that are lagging behind and they were to ad adopt our idea, they could expand funding for that program and, and roll it out farther and, 
and with more uh, depth and breadth. Uh, but just what universities are, again, really good at is fundamental research. And I view that more as a kind of a, a, a national um, objectional goal. Um, so perhaps the government can get more involved in, in, in that aspect. Stephen or Louise, would you get? Yeah, sure. So another area where development economics has done a lot of work and made a lot of progress over the last, let's say, uh, 15 to really 20 years now has to do with the presence of institutions. That is to say, laws, rules of the game, as well as norms and the effects that they have on opportunities for future successful economic development as well as um, social progress. And a key uh, institution that seems to really matter is how inclusive they are and how much they facilitate for the broad, as broad as possible, a, you know, um, a range of people in the society um, progress. So with in, with in this regard, I think through that lens, uh, it's likely that if uh, the U.S. were examined as if it were a developing country, the way that we finance our local school systems would come up for some attention. Namely, it's very difficult to find other advanced countries, I believe, that finance their local schools by local property taxes, which seems almost destined to reinforce the interge you know, intergenerational transmission of poverty and so on. So I think that to the extent that the federal government could be uh, convinced to um, focus more resources for school systems in lagging areas, that would be an obvious um, extrapolation from this kind of literature. Yeah. Yeah. Louise, anything you want to add? Um, I guess what I would say, one issue that is really coming to the fore in developing countries is the problem of small fragmented uh, urban government, so lots of little uh, jurisdictions that can't get together and get a big enough catchment area or think of themselves as an economic zone the way, for example, the greater D.C. Baltimore area does. And the role of the federal government in transport, in forcing uh, that thinking, maybe it, um, it could be extended. We talk about Tr the federal governments in developing countries trying to extend those kinds of incentives and pushes um, to get those uh, small areas to work together. Of course, it's all the politicians who don't want to lose their job and their power base, et cetera. But um, it is a problem in the U.S. It is the problem in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area for sure. Um, and it's I think there's a whole separate project at Brookings that uh, that looks at that whole issue. But uh, I sort of wonder if the federal government can play a better role um, on this issue um, in areas outside of, uh, of transport um, to try to get some consolidation of these uh, urban areas to get some economies of scale and better governance. Great. Um, I th we have time for one more. One more question? Okay, great. So we'll ask one more question then, uh, which is, um, sorry. Uh, I wonder if we could, there are really, I'd say about a third of the questions here, keep coming back to this issue of, of how we make sure the, the training people are getting is matching the jobs they are going to be ready for. I think there's often a, a sense of the question of to what extent there's a gap between people's preparation and the, and the jobs that are available for them. And what role both at the high school level and at the, the college level we need to be thinking about there and how we can do a better job there, whether it's at the school system level or at the federal level. And so, I don't know, Becky, do you want to start there? Let me start in on that. I mean, I, I will echo what someone else here said. I think businesses have to be involved in the educational system. They have to be invited in. They have to be involved in, in career prep. And, you know, career prep means something different in middle school and high school than it does for graduate students. But you need to be doing it in terms of acquaintance with what does this mean and, you know, you know whether, you know, dad's coming in and talking about mom's coming in and talking about what they do, um, you know, that... That type of connection is important. Once you get into um, 
it's the technical training realm, whether that's in high school or whether that's in two-year schools, um, you have to have very close collaboration because there are too many examples of training people for degrees that nobody wants, right? right? Now, once you get into the four-year liberal arts colleges, that's a different story because we're not training people for a job. We're training people for careers. And this is where you know the argument about why do you have English and art history and all that, because those are really important long-term understanding skills about the world that people need to know who are going to be out there for careers. And so th there are, you know, engagement in this just means something different. Having said that, I'll say one thing that I think most universities do a very bad job of and that we're really working on at Wisconsin, and I don't know if we're doing it better, but um, professional schools do a great job of career training for their students. They do a lousy job of career training for their liberal arts majors, which are usually the majority of their students, right? Because, you know, an English student or a math student or a physics student are very unlikely to go out and work in those fields. They're going to take the skills they have and end up in business or law or medicine. And um, so we are trying to really up our game on career preparation of liberal arts students mm -hmm. and put a whole program around that starting in sophomore year to get people to think more consciously about what will political science major get me? What have people who've gotten political science majors out of this university ever done? What jobs does it lead to? And using our alums very consciously as well as local businesses in that. And um, you know, there's just, there's a lot more here that needs to be done in that whole area. Great, thank you. I think we're gonna wrap there and take a short break. Um, we'll have a next panel coming up in just about five or 10 minutes uh, on the impact of structural racism and the history of segregation on regional inequality, which I think is gonna be a terrific panel. So please come back shortly and we'll just thank the panelists a great deal for those comments. Thank you. And my name is Tracy Jan. I'm a reporter with the Washington Post and I am very honored to be here today with these gentlemen. I actually came to the Post two years ago to write about race and the economy. And it's a new beat that I created that's very broad. It covers everything from housing policy to the racial wealth gap. And more recently, I was in Ferguson four years after Michael Brown was killed to write about how economic development has been unequal in that area, most notably the neighborhood in, where, in which he was shot and killed um, has been left behind, which is not a surprise to a lot of folks. But I am here, I'm going to introduce Bradley Hardy. He's an associate professor of public administration and policy at American University and a senior economic fellow, so, sorry, a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution. He's also a visiting scholar with the Center of Household Financial Stability at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. His research examines trends and the sources of income volatility and intergenerational mobility within the United States, with a focus on socioeconomically disadvantaged families. Same thing I write about, so this is great. Professor Hardy is one of the authors of the paper, which we will be discussing. Uh, professor Frederick Weary is a sociology professor at Princeton University, as well as the president of the Social Science History Association. His research focuses on how race and other identities matter in the marketplace, how individuals make sense of credit and debt, and how some communities, but not others, can more easily use their cultural traditions to revitalize their neighborhoods. Professor Weary serves on the Community Development Research Advisory Council of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, where I used to work at the Boston Globe, and is finishing a new book on financial citizenship that will be out in April. So let's get started. The paper is a pretty ambitious um, yeah. document given that examines the history of how racist policies have resulted in inequality when it comes to housing, education, incarceration rates, political power, and even the role of federal assistance. So I was hoping you could help us connect how this history is still lingering today. Are there current policies that have racial dimensions or implications? Sure. I mean, and you know, the, the project, I have to say, was joint with uh, Trevon Logan at Ohio State and, and John Parman at uh, William & Mary. So, um, you know, this paper was ambitious, and we really had to pull from a whole large body of social sciences literature. And, um, you know, the hope is that the reader comes away uh, wanting to learn more from all of those disciplines. Um, but what I can say is that, we found in our research that you know, many of the policies were I intentional, uh, particularly historically so. Uh, you can think about policies including but not limited to uh, redlining that, that has had sort of long-term 
uh, negative consequences for uh, black wealth. Um, and you can see that here in the metropolitan area in Washington, D.C., but nationwide. Um, but, but even public policies that don't have a specific racial dimension but have disproportionately negative consequences uh, for, for black Americans and, and other Americans of color, right? So um, those include um, how we structure uh, local school spending and a lot of the very good causal evidence that um, actually, you know, school spending does positively influence um, economic and educational outcomes. Um, that, in fact, was somewhat of a puzzle even, you know, 20 years ago, but some of the new evidence um, kind of confirms what a lot of us thought we knew, that these sorts of investments matter. Uh, or, or even how uh, the devolved welfare state allocates benefits, um, and it, it turns out there are differences across race. Uh, there's been contemporary work showing that uh, black clients uh, of TANF um, have tended to be discriminated against, uh, sanctioned at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so these things add up. Yeah. And even now the welfare to work policies, well not welfare to work, but just yeah. the work requirements that some states such as Michigan recently is instituting disproportionately impacting black recipients than white recipients of aid. Sure, so. and, and you know, and to that point, and I'm, and I'm sure Fred's gonna jump in here also, I think it's important to note that these sorts of public policies m may have very clear, observable, deleterious impacts on black Americans and other Americans of color, but you know, it's gonna very oftentimes affect that entire metropolitan area uh, negatively, right? So uh, there's efficiency implications uh, to how these things are designed that, that don't just affect uh, that one group. Right, yeah. right, good. Professor Weary, I'd love for you to talk to us more about how race continues to play out in places that might be surprising to some folks, given that laws were passed 50 years ago to outlaw redlining and other forms of racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. And let me just say before I, I'm going to open with a little story, but before I open Good. with the story, let me just say that uh, if you haven't read this paper uh, that they've authored, you should do it this week, oh, probably really today. Nice so just read the, <laughs> this is the book, read the paper. Okay. Um, I didn't pay him to say that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I don't accept money for the, these sorts of things. Um, okay. So, um, so here's the story. Um, we, sometimes we see race and we see place um, in situations where they don't belong. Um, and one of those situations, there's a researcher at Wisconsin, Rourke O'Brien, and uh, his collaborator, uh, Barbara Kivian at Harvard, and they sent out these resumes to hiring managers, hiring professionals, over a thousand hiring professionals. And one of the questions they were asking by sending out these resumes is, um, when you control for, sort of black versus a white applicant, uh, and they have a subprime credit score, and everything else is more or less the same, uh, what is, are, you know, are they likely to be hired, and what's the suggested starting salary? Mm. Now, it's at that level of suggested starting salary that we see a big difference. So, you know, two resumes equivalent in all other respects, but the black applicant gets the lower suggested starting salary. And when they're, in, when they're sort of digging into this, they're also finding that there's a lot of moralized language around how you interpret a credit score. So what credit scores were supposed to do is get us out of the, the identity stuff. Is what, what some people uh, think about it. The identity stuff, let's get out of the identity stuff, let's get a, get a score. Um, you don't get out of the identity stuff. Now, where is place? Uh, so one of the difficulties with scoring is that we, we haven't had a lot of work until recently that's tr tried to tie sort of these individualized scores to, to places. Um, there's a recent uh, uh, piece by the Boston Fed uh, author, Anmol Ashada, and one of the things he does is he says, well, let's look, at the let's look at neighborhoods and see where the subprime scores are by neighborhood. And so if you're in a neighborhood, uh, some neighborhoods where you already have concentrated disadvantage, you have about half the households, subprime or no score. Other neighborhoods, more advantage, we're much lower percentage, just sort of a 5%. So what does it mean for a person who is in a locality where every other household subprime score or no score at all. And so part of what we're seeing is that the menu of choices, so on the one hand we talk about the choices that people are making, how do we help people make better choices, but the menu of choices is being structured locally. Um, so, uh, so you can imagine that if you're, you've got kids other, and everybody compares what the other people do with their kids. Yeah. Um, and if there's some school trip or there's some event 
graduations are terrible because you end up spending lots of money, yeah. even if you don't want to. Um, if you don't want to spend the money because uh, you're going to have to use a high cost alternative uh, financial service provider, it's very difficult to say that you can't get access to the money when all the other parents can. So that your menu of choices is really based on what the other adults in your locality are able to do. And you just sort of push down the other information about how much it's going to cost you. Yeah. And so you have these situations of a disadvantage that even when you come up with something like a score that's supposed to wipe out identity, the scores are being used very differently by virtue of race. So you're talking about white and black ap job applicants with the same credit score? S same credit score. But same black other applicants are being offered much lower starting salaries. A, a, lower st a, a suggested lower starting salary. Now, the reason why this study, I think, is important is because we often sort of talk about, well, there's probably something happening um, interactionally, uh, and there may be sort of uh, cultural capital cues that are either sent or not sent um, at the point of the interview. And what this establishes is that uh, we can actually see that there is a sort of um, an initial uh, sort of condition of disadvantage. And so by virtue of status, you sort of st your starting point is, is slightly lower. Um, and, and presumably the, uh, the returns on investment for your work experience and your education um, are just are going to be less. And so if you have a different return on investment for things like education and work experience, then you're going to get a divergence. And if you have a slightly lower sort of starting salary to begin with, you're also sort of another way of divergence. And so there, there are different ways in which we're seeing sort of diverging fortunes. Um, and some of our sort of technologies that are meant to sort of wipe out identity don't wipe it out. It, it simply sort of Offers up a new tool. Now, this doesn't mean that we that so this doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about credit scores. It does mean that we need to think more creatively about how do you help people uh, avoid really high cost service providers in their locales. Because one of the one of the other difficulties that people also face is that when they're going to get help to try to get themselves out of financial straits, they're often being given advice about you know you shouldn't have gone for that high cost short term loan. Right. And what else were they supposed to do? Now, the, the, the other difficulty is that when sometimes options are offered that are, you know, they're not, they're, they're still high cost, but they're much cheaper than what's, what they would have had access to anyway, sometimes policy, policy advocates say, don't do that either. And so sometimes in, in this push for economic justice, we're on this course for justice in which no one can really see salvation. So on the issue of banking, um, recently, the last two years, it's been this push the hashtag bank black movement pushed by some high profile celebrities. And it's because in many communities there are bank deserts. The only way to get a loan to pay for that field trip is a payday loan. So could you talk a little bit about that? How realistic is it for black banks to be the salvation of communities that otherwise would not be able to get you know, mortgage loans given that certain banks, Wells Fargo, have been fined or have reached huge settlements for charging black and brown communities disproportionately high um, rates and subprime loans. So is that unrealistic to expect black banks to carry that, especially since their numbers are dwindling? I mean, in my own opinion, and, and I have a particular slice here thinking about income and earnings uh, volatility among many workers, uh, is that, well, this is something that uh, the U.S. banking and financial system should take on, and particularly thinking about the different financial instruments that are available to low and moderate income uh, workers. Uh, so uh, how do we handle things like fees and fines uh, for various types of overdrafts? Um, that's quite a bit of resources being extracted from mm -hmm. folks who don't have much to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so I'm absolutely sympathetic to the idea that um, you know, those resources can, can be kept uh, uh, among uh, some communities, and that can have all sorts of positive spillovers potentially. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the, the national banks have a, mm -hmm. uh, a role to play. And, and my, my colleague here, uh, Aaron Klein at Brookings, has done a lot of work thinking about these sorts of financial tools and how they maybe intentionally or unintentionally uh, you know, harm people of color and, and the working poor. And um, I, I, whatever, I've been asked this question, um, and, and, and usually in private, uh, because in <laughs> private I can sort of apologize for not being a proper race man, um, <laughs> uh, because 
it's not the the it's not the it's not a realistic sort of solution. Um, and, and those Black banks are not. Uh, I'm, I, so they should be there, and in fact, we should have a variety of options. Um, uh, but uh, for a number of reasons that are outlined uh, in the uh, uh, Mesra uh, uh, Badaran's uh, The Color of Banking oh, yeah. book, yeah. Uh, it, it's just not a realistic sort of um, scalable alternative for these communities. The, the other thing I think t uh, to keep in mind is uh, part of the spirit of pushing uh, black banks, I think, is, is the spirit of saying, uh, why don't we have more financial services that are co-produced by the community? And sort of when we think about the co-production of commerce, uh, that is in the spirit in which the black bank is offered. And so we can think about co-production of financial services that are not based in geography, and, um, mm -hmm. but that have sort of geographically placed actors who are trusted community actors who help get those services to people who need them. And, and so because so much has now happened in terms of financial technologies, we have to move away from some of these old models of sort of the, uh, the, the sort of the one type of financial service and that's gonna fix it for people who have very complicated lives. And so you have people who, um, you, who are often working more than one job and don't have as much control over their schedules and they're trying to have to uh, figure how they're gonna sort of fit in their time to get to a bank, a traditional bank. And it's just not real. So there are a lot of things that are just are not realistic for, for people today who don't have the kinds of predictable schedules that, they, that people once did. Yeah. Um, no, I, mean, I was going to say, I mean, we can talk about specific solutions too, you. right? Yeah, I know. I, mean, I, I, I was joking around. I'm already hot natured, so, yeah. you know, I, I've got my handkerchief. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's interesting. You, you can think about specific solutions, though. I mean, I, I think that there's opportunities for uh, local public policy officials to push their, uh, their local firms to do employee assistance funds. Um, there are initiatives uh, now for folks to consider uh, drawing down a day or a week's pay uh, because there are short-term events that come up uh, that you know doing this once or twice a month doesn't necessarily work for everybody right and so I, I do think that there's a there's a role for financial literacy um, but at the same time you know I've heard it argued and I'm sympathetic to this that you know the the poor and near poor are actually quite great stewards of limited resources and that oftentimes um, some of these, these choices, even if it's a, a particularly uh, high interest loan, it's a sort of choosing between the best of sort of bad alternatives. And, and so I think we can make improvements there. Is that a local problem? Is that a national problem? Well, it, you know, it's going to happen at the local level. So. Yeah. I mean, I was, I, I was in Mississippi last December um, writing about work, uh, sorry, federal assistance programs, and I was speaking to this woman. She happened to be white, but she was... It was multi-generational poverty, and the, old, the mother, who has grandchildren, so she's a little older, was talking about how pleased she was that this uh, short-term loan program was offering her yet another loan to buy her Christmas gifts because she had, was doing so well paying off her first loan that they offered her another one. She was just so pleased by that. And other folks in better financial, you know, more stability would have been like, whoa, you know, that's not really the best place, but she had really had no other alternative. And so that was sure. the product that was geared towards her and she appreciated it, sure. paying yeah. a lot of interest on it. Um, so moving to the subject of federal assistance, we know that the majority of recipients who get food stamps and Medicaid, um, Section 8 housing happen to be white in this country just because our country is, as for now, predominantly white. Um, the political rhetoric would have you think otherwise, but I wanted to know from you, given your research um, on the role of anti-poverty transfer programs, yeah. what can you talk about this a little bit more, especially in the context of policies that are being advanced by the Trump administration? Sure. You know, I, I would first start off by saying that, you, you know, thinking about transfer policy, income support policies in the U.S., there's a, there's a recent uh, history, including welfare reform, where there's been a momentum for, for how we think about TANF policy, refundable tax credits, um, food stamps. And, and so one, we've got a lot of folks who are employed, but who are employed um, in sort of uh, relatively low income jobs, right? So 
they're working with food stamps, they're working with refundable tax credits to make ends meet. Um, and so these are important supports uh, for folks. And so one is just important across race to acknowledge that the, the, the snapshot of the welfare recipient really has to evolve uh, to folks who are out here working. Um, it's not to say that there's not some folks who aren't, but many are and are trying to. Um, and it was yeah. created, the whole program was created for white women, right? That's Whose right. Whose husbands were... That's right. Them. So there's been this evolution. Right. I mean, there's a couple of points though, right? I mean, one, um, uh, attitudes vary across individuals and across regions. There has been this history of sanctioning uh, people of color, uh, causal research done out of Florida looking at uh, harsher sanctioning policy and welfare. Fast forwarding to your question, uh, I, I do think that there's policies on the books right now, uh, including uh, pushing work requirements onto other uh, social safety net programs. Again, this doesn't necessarily have an explicit uh, racial implication, uh, but a lot, a lot of times the devil's in the details. So mm -hmm. what sorts of work supports are you going to provide? Uh, what sorts of training and search assistance are you going to provide? And very oftentimes in these uh, federal bureaucracies that allocate uh, you know, the actual implementation to the, the localities, uh, that sort of thing can fall apart quickly. And, and so I think it's a reason to be cautious. Um, this is a safety net that uh, does a lot of good. It's not that we can't have improvements. Um, but this is something we kind of have to keep our eyes on. Where are there disproportionate impacts um, that are going to harm uh, many Americans of color uh, and many white Americans, frankly? So to your earlier point, um, you know, the, the, the safety net um, has many white Americans and non-white Americans who benefit, right? Um, but, but understanding that, that legacy of sort of uh, differential treatment and some of which lingers today, uh, there's some good work out of the Urban Institute um, looking at differences in the allocation uh, of income, um, income support in the welfare program. And I think a lot of the coping issues, including some that you've worked on with uh, Kristen Seafelt, mm -hmm. you know, sort of thinking about how families need liquidity. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do we think about that insurance mechanism? Yeah. And, and I'll just add that um, one of my colleagues, Kathy Eaton, and, and, and a lot of people that she works with, they've looked at the earned income tax credit. Yep. Um, and it's important that it is earned um, for those families in the sense that uh, one of the things that we sometimes take for granted is it's not just the what the program delivers, but it's how the program delivers it yep. and what message it sends to people about their uh, self, their worth, yep. um, and about their capacity to make legitimate decisions for themselves and their families. And so, so if, if we're thinking about a model of, a, of some of the types of programs that I think seem to work but have not been uh, location-based but work nonetheless, I say the EITC. The other thing I'll say about locations is um, while uh, people may be confined to neighborhoods of uh, and communities of disadvantage, uh, when someone leaves that community, uh, they don't necessarily leave that community yeah. in the sense that uh, when emergencies emerge, they are then called upon by their family networks to, mm -hmm. to sort of provide us assistance. And while this may sort of then mean that holding income and occupation education constant, uh, you have then black and Latinx um, individuals who are going to have a slower rate of asset accumulation because they just have more requests coming in from their, their networks that cross these community lines. Uh, they're still doing okay. Um, and they're still able to sort of make up for some of the gaps in the social safety net because the, much of that safety net is now being privatized and individualized, so. Right, right. I wanna to get to some of the audience questions, which are all quite good. Um, on continuing on this trend, this conversation about segregated communities, um, this audience member had a question about food deserts. So given that historically neighborhoods have been segregated, um, one impact is a lack of affordable quality food availability. Um, this person was talking about Dallas, but when I was in Ferguson, I saw the same thing. It, Ferguson actually is a beautiful community. You just wouldn't know it by some of the places that people have reported from. And this particular part of it where Michael Brown's grandmother w was living and where he was killed has like no accessible grocery store. There's liquor stores where you can buy food, prepackaged food, and there is a grocery store you have to drive to, but many people don't have cars. Mm -hmm. 
So can you talk a little bit about how we incentivize businesses, stores to open in these types of places? Because they are, after all, businesses. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, mean that, you know, I would just start by saying uh, there's definitely a, a role you can imagine for local and state governments to, to incentivize this sort of investment. Uh, I think that, in particular, you also have to think about the, the nation's effective uh, food assistance programs, right? So you, you have to talk about these things in concert. And one of the things that gets missed here is that providing effective food assistance through SNAP uh, food stamps has had long-term positive economic benefits. Uh, we have, uh, in my view, uh, credible research to, to show that. And this links to uh, educational performance in the classroom, and it's intuitive, right? I mean, if you're sitting around hungry, you're not going to learn as well. You're going to be more stressed out. Uh, and so then getting back to this issue of food deserts, absolutely, I think there's a, a local policy opportunity. Oftentimes, businesses are, 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 are going to, in my own opinion, um, view those investments as costly. Um, how do we build relationships uh, to encourage folks uh, to take those chances that are good for the community? Uh, how do you even assess the quality within the actual establishment? So it's one thing for a business to open up the, the grocery store, but can you assess the quality of the products uh, inside, right? And, and that's going to matter quite a bit. Right. Yeah. One of the, the other challenges, uh, and this is not an apology for sort of what businesses have not done, <laughs> but one of the challenges is that um, when you're in a community where you've not had access to basic grocery stores, you've had to make some adaptations. And when you have a very limited budget and you know that sort of your kids like high carbs because it's going to hold them, then when someone shows up with lots of things that look a little fluffy and, okay, they're organic and the chickens ran free, uh, a parent <laughs> cannot take the risk that they're going to put this expensive meal on the table sure. and the children won't be full and they might not even eat it. And so there is this, so there is this dance of both, um, there is already a, a set of consumption demands um, and there's not enough of a conversation about um, are, are there ways of tweaking some of these existing consumption demands so that it's healthier for kids? Really um, and so that sort of a business that comes in isn't simply sort of rolling out from things that would be really desirable for me, uh, <laughs> but might not be so desirable yeah, right. for yeah. sort of, you know, a kid who's like, oh, okay, don't tell me it's organic because I don't even know what that is. Right. right. Well, in, in this neighborhood in Ferguson, again, the, all the liquor stores took EBT and food yep. stamps, you know, that, that you could buy things with that milk, they sold milk. There was a convenience store gas station, the Quick Trip, that had burned down during the protest. And that's where a lot of the people in that in those developments went to shop and they, they missed that. Right now it's this um, really nice urban league center, it's a community center, but some people in the community are like, we want to get our medicine, we want to get our milk. Um, but beyond that, they want fresh food. Now there are food, tr there's a food truck that goes in a couple times a week um, and they do, accept food stamps and they sell fresh vegetables, but what's a more permanent solution? You, you know, and, and along, along Fred's point, I, I would just kind of piggyback and say that we also have to, at a national and subnational level, kind of start to acknowledge the realities of, of many working poor and near poor uh, families, uh, including but not limited to families of color, right? And a lot of this, it transcends race, ethnicity, but these are folks who are working one, one and a half jobs. They're incurring high transportation costs, both monetarily and, and time-wise. And so that food consumption is increasingly occurring uh, out of the house, right, or on the run. So they're stopping by some of these places. This is just sort of an everyday reality. Uh, nice Hamilton paper from a few years back by uh, Jim Ziliak looking at this issue um, that, you know, modernizing how we think about food access and food assistance is going to be important. Right, yeah. right. Um, this is another really great question that we probably won't be able to address fully in our time, but how should we think about forces like gentrification and nimbyism when attempting to address the issue of segregation? I want to respond to this. I'll give it to you first because I just finished talking, <laughs> okay. right? So, oh, oh, okay. Uh, oh, oh. If you want it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, um, I'll, I'll let you go first. Yeah, well, well okay, so, so you know, 
Uh, I've got new work uh, with a Brookings fellow here, uh, Marcus Casey, where we've sort of examined the evolution of neighborhoods since roughly uh, the Johnson appointed Kerner Commission on Civil Unrest. So this is the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission. And, you know, one of the things we find is that on the one hand, uh, there's been a decline in sort of explicit forms of racial discrimination, uh, and yet black neighborhoods have had some improvements, but there's wide gaps across the usual suspect socioeconomic measures. Um, at the same time, some of that divestment, some of that urban flight has also provided opportunities for neighborhood change, for, for gentrification, uh, those values um, of homes, you know, fell down. These are places close to the city center, uh, quite desirable. A and so I think that, one, this is a huge issue. Uh, two, com combating it really does bring to mind um, an actionable policy. We, we have a, a, a former HUD secretary here, and, uh, <laughs> you know, here in the D.C. metro area, you've got housing assistance oversubscribed, right? And, and you think about the housing costs, and the idea that this is taking such a big bite out of the, the household balance sheet. I think for many households, uh, you know, neighborhood change, gentrification has its own social ramifications. But on a practical basis, my own view is that you just want somewhere that's convenient to be able to access job opportunities, right? And maybe I'm telling too terse of a story here, uh, but that takes investments, right? That, and that's where maybe a local policy does take, in my view, you know, federal resources, uh, federal investment. Yeah. I mean, so, um, and, and this here's an admission. Uh, I, I think I'm a gentrifier because I, <laughs> I live in, I moved to Harlem a, a few years ago, and I split my time between Harlem and Princeton. So Harlem is a place that is undergoing gentrification. Um, and, and some segments, um, the, some of the areas where uh, there has been protection is if you were in a really big, a building that I would not consider attractive, but a really big public housing building, you're probably okay. If you're in one of the sort of more attractive, which is most of the housing stock, uh, you're not so okay. And what they've done is they've uh, transferred some of those and transformed some of those into mixed income units. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, if you get to return to your mixed income unit, and so part of, I, I think they were very good about sort of, uh, we joke that the nice little old ladies, um, they got to go back to their unit because I think that just would have looked really bad. Um, and a lot of other people did not. Yeah. Uh, in other areas, uh, there were uh, uh, public defenders in the community discussing sort of the strategies of um, the landlords to just get people out because suddenly your elevator doesn't work for a couple of days in the winter. Uh, and, and then the, they had to shut off the boiler for a couple of days at a time, and then they start slipping notes under your door. Uh, you know, uh, don't you want to go back and visit your, to, to your family in the South? We'll give you a pack of money and put you on a bus. Uh, so this is sort of the experience. And so, so one of the difficulties is that, of course, a lot of amenities have come into the community. Uh, but one of the other things that we know is that as amenities come into the community and as the housing stock gr greatly appreciates, there's a recent paper by... Um, uh, 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 Goldstein and, and Social Forces and a co-author. Uh, one of the things that also increases is police presence to protect those investments. So and so one of the things that we take for granted is just as sort of the amenities are coming in, and I've seen this from the window, there was a party that was had spilled out onto the sidewalk. I look to my left, I see, and not to stereotype, but three levels of women in, um, in, uh, in their yoga pants, because they were all wearing yoga pants, on three different <laughs> floors, and they're all on the phone, and then suddenly the police are swarming, and, and they, they sort of, to contain a party that where nothing, as far as I can tell, was happening, except there were lots of teenagers, and they all looked like me. Uh, and so this is one of the things that we, we, it's hard to sort of reconcile, because on the one hand, I love the neighborhood, and I'm glad I'm there. On the other hand, I know that sort of having my unit appreciate has also sort of brought the neighborhood more amenities, more police uh, presence, and has pushed a number of people out with no sort of plans for sort of what you do with them. Right, right. Yes. And there's also the opposite of that is, you know, with HUD grants, for example, you have to be able to use them to not perpetuate segregation. And when certain groups try to do that, there are other powerful liberal groups that don't want them there, like in Houston, for example. So yeah. Yeah. it is a you know, big, big issue. 
we only have about five minutes left, so I will go on to another question. Um, okay. This was brought up earlier, but it wasn't quite addressed in a different panel. Uh, the question of opportunity zone legislation and how that could potentially help revitalize distressed communities. Um, to what extent could race hamper the success of opportunity zones? a tough question so I don't know that I'll answer that question completely um, but what I will say as a social scientist right the public policy is going to do what it tries to do but we're trying to understand human behavior and so you know people in the US are sorting on uh, demographics including race and educational attainment uh, there have been several studies, including uh, those by Putnam and others, uh, showing that people in the U.S. are increasingly sorting on these dimensions. Uh, and so you could think about local maps uh, where you see, um, you know, parental education, uh, racial characteristics, and, and you can kind of predict uh, home values and what's more and less desirable. I, I certainly think that, you know, public policy has to kind of reckon with that. Um, I, I will say, and I don't know that this is a, a, an elegant um, seg, but there was another comment in, in the last panel that I just wanted to briefly touch on, which is that local policy, be it opportunity zone or otherwise, well, you know, you have uh, institutions, for example, the higher ed institutions that are situated in communities nationwide. And I do think there's a role to play there, for example, in, in bringing leaders together I think one of the comments from uh, Chancellor Blank was that we need people who will, will build bridges to communicate between the private sector, the educational institutions, and government. I think back to my hometown of Durham, North Carolina. One such leader who was doing this work, thinking about education, workforce, and employment was a guy, uh, Fail Wynn, who ran the community college in Durham and then worked with Duke University. You think about the the, the value of Duke in terms of being one of the largest employers in Durham, uh, that alone mm -hmm. has an economic benefit. But how does Duke interact with the Durham area with respect to housing and investments uh, in terms of economic development? Mm -hmm. and, and so having people who can provide that bridge, I think there's opportunities there. And that, you could think about that as local policy, mm -hmm. how that relates to opportunity zones. You know, Maybe that's beyond the scope of what I can comment on, but there's local opportunities there. Yeah, I, I think the only caution uh, I'd offer is um, too often in a community of color, especially if it's had uh, sort of a history of suffering, um, when investments come in, sometimes community members have a very different idea of what they want to do in their communities, and they're getting pushback from the outside by saying that sort of thing won't work in that kind of place. Right. Uh, and so there is a way in which uh, the history of place can sometimes uh, uh, diminish the types of investments that come in or put restrictions on what you do once it, once it arrives. Yeah. Um, and so that's, so that's the, my own, and, and, and sort of that's my sort of way of um, trying to understand how s structural racism, how sort of a sense of hierarchy uh, inserts itself um, in a moment in which judgments are made. Um, and in a moment in which the value of place and the value of different types of investments are being assessed. Right, and that's, that's exactly what happened in Ferguson. Like the, the people who are trying to redevelop that community, I mean, half these apartments are empty, and so it's not like you're displacing anyone. There's no one in half the apartments, but there are still people who live in the neighborhood, and some of them feel like what they wanted to see happen is not what the developers want to see happen. Developers need to make something work economically, or there's financial incentive for them, so. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, now I have to fan you some more. <laughs> I'm taking the gym now. Yeah. I'm taking the water. Yeah, take, the, take your water. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I forgot about this.
to just start while the panel's getting mic'd up and uh, introduce the panel and, uh, and then tell you a little about what I'd like to discuss on it. Uh, so we're going to be talking about federal investments to drive local growth. Uh, I'm Ryan Nunn, the policy director for the Hamilton Project. So I'll start by introducing uh, the panel. Starting to my left, Sean Donovan is the senior strategist and uh, advisor to the president on Alston and campus development at Harvard University. Sean was previously the director of the Office of Management and Budget, and before that, the secretary of HUD. To Sean's left, Tracy Gordon uh, is a senior fellow with the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. Previously, she was a senior economist at the Council of Economic Advisors, and she's done valuable research in a variety of topics related to state and local public finance. And she's also the author of one of the Hamilton Project's policy proposals that you can find in our book. And then finally, to Stacy's left, Maurice Jones is the president and CEO of the nonprofit Local Initiatives Support Corporation, or LISC. He has also served as Virginia's Secretary of Commerce and Deputy Secretary at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. I think you'll find that we really have an ideal set of people here to talk about these two proposals and the issues that, uh, the larger set of issues that they address. So we do have two really interesting proposals, one of which is written by Tracy Gordon, uh, and which focuses on federal grants to states and how they might be modified. The other proposal is by David Newmark, who is not here. And that one is, is much more fine-grained in the sense that it focuses on neighborhoods and problems of concentrated poverty. So because David is not here, I'm going to just give you a really quick outline of that proposal before we start with the panel. So David begins by discussing the challenges he sees it for place-based policy, uh, talking about areas of very concentrated poverty in the United States. So if you define extreme poverty, as he does, by uh, looking at areas that have at least a 40% poverty rate at a very local level, you find 6.2 million people living in those places, uh, more than 4,000 areas of extreme poverty, mostly clustered in the Midwest and the Northeast. And so what David then does is discuss a body of research that has evaluated the place-based policies that have already been implemented over the preceding decades. And he's quite skeptical about those policies, finding that in general, uh, they have not been cost effective. Uh, he identifies problems that make place-based policy very difficult to implement in, uh, related to low skills, to inadequate infrastructure and, and crime, among other problems. So that's David's assessment of the problem. And then he actually goes on, though, to propose uh, a way of reconfiguring our place-based policies that he thinks would work, that he thinks benefits from what we've learned about these policies that have not worked as well. And so he proposes a, uh, a job subsidy program called Rebuilding Communities Job Subsidies that retains the traditional goal of this kind of place-based policy in that it is subsidizing hiring and job creation. But it has a few elements that he thinks will allow it to, to do better than we've done in the past. One is that the work is specifically tied to improving the area in which the uh, residents live. The other element is that it would target people who are initially residents of the neighborhood. And the third element is that it, it focuses really on skill building and on uh, helping those who are targeted to get to a you know, long-term career success in the, in the private sector. So, the, the way this would work, it's a two-phase program. It would start with an 18-month period during which uh, the job would be fully subsidized and would be provided by a local nonprofit working in partnership with a, uh, sometimes with national level nonprofits. After that phase, in the second 18-month phase, the job would be 50% subsidized and would be a private sector job. And so the idea is that those nonprofit jobs transition to private sector jobs and that skill building is, is happening throughout the process. And so that's a very quick tour of David's proposal. I really recommend that you read both proposals in the book. I think they are fantastic. Um, and, uh, and I'd also like to remind you, as with previous panels, please do start writing your questions down on the note cards, uh, and those will be collected. So now I'd like to turn the discussion over to Tracy Gordon. So Tracy, your, your proposal aims to comprehensively reform the way that federal grants are distributed across states. Can you just tell us what, problem you see, what problems you see there and, and sort of how your proposal addresses them? 
Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to be on this panel with people who, and people in the audience who have actually run public programs and can tell me where I've gotten it right and where I've gotten it wrong. Um, but this proposal starts from the observation, much like Henry Paulson talking about the troubled asset relief program, that we've got this $700 billion bazooka and why don't we use it? So uh, people typically talk about place-based assistance and some of the merits and demerits of these policies as much of the morning discussion has talked about. Um, but overlooking the fact that we have the $700 billion apparatus that's, that injects about 3.5% of GDP into the economy, and there are ways that we can make it work better. Um, so work that I've done looks at this concept of fiscal capacity, or the gap between what states could raise in revenue if they were to tax their resources at nationally representative rates, and what they would have to spend to reach national averages given their economic and demographic conditions. So some places just have more workloads for public programs. They've got more low-income people who are going to call on public programs. They've got more kids to educate. We adjust for those kinds of factors as well as the cost of labor and basically find that most states have a gap in the revenues that could be available to them, not what they're actually taxing, but what they could tax regardless of political decisions and what they would have to spend to look like the rest of the country. Now, federal grants go a long way to closing those gaps, but gaps remain in about half of all states. <coughs> And that's not surprising because the way that our federal grant system works, it's not really meant to equalize differences in fiscal capacity. Oftentimes you have to have money to get money. So there are maintenance of effort requirements, there are matching requirements, things that were put in place to try to avoid gaming, or in some cases things that are sort of political, like small state minimums um, or hold harmless requirements. Um, so, and in addition, you have uh, grant formulas, I think we've talked about in some of the uh, <coughs> previous to this, that are just out of step with current economic and social reality. So community development block grants are awarded based on uh, the age of the housing stock, which in a place that's gentrifying actually could be a positive attribute. Um, you have highway grants that have a lot to do with how much states contribute to the highway trust fund and not necessarily the condition of the roads or the roughness, as another Hamilton Project uh, paper has proposed. Um, so this proposal suggests we can do better than what we're already doing. We can make federal grants more reflective of local conditions in terms of need uh, for, for uh, federal money. So uh, for example, switching the federal matching rate uh, formula from per uh, capita personal income to poverty. So a place like DC and a place like Connecticut have the same per capita personal income, but the poverty rate is twice as high in DC as Connecticut. Um, looking at the cost of providing services like labor um, and also looking at fiscal capacity and there are various <laughs> ways you can do that. And then I also propose making a provision of the Recovery Act the automatic increase in the federal matching rate permanent. Um, and uh, there are various ways you could do that. The way that I propose has to do with looking at sustained uh, decreases in the employment rate and uh, basically turning on this program when the half of all states are experiencing that um, over a four month period. Um, and then there are questions about uh, what you would actually provide to these places. Um, there have been proposals to make the aid conditional on changes in wages and salaries, and when you would turn off the aid, how you would make sure that states are not substituting the money um, or using it for their own objectives and not um, this, this national goal of equalizing um, uh, or getting the economy back to full steam. Um, so there are all kinds of questions about sort of timing and targeting and how do you ensure that federal objectives are being met, but I don't think that means that we shouldn't do it. We've learned a lot from experience, including the Recovery Act, and so I hope this proposal can start a conversation about that. Great, thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn next to Sean, and, and we'll get back to the specifics of your proposal, Tracy, but I, I guess what I want to ask you is, what is it about the U.S. in 2018 that necessitates this sort of proposal, whether David's or Tracy's? And... Uh, you know, what do you think first about when you're considering place-based policies? Yeah. So first, just at the, at the very highest level and maybe going back to, to Jason's framing initially, I, I think one of the things that excites me about bringing this group together on this subject now and the sort of urgency of in 2018 why place-based policies matter is that I, I do think we have an emerging body of research that really confirms in a way that we haven't been able to before, not that just that uh, places are different and people are sorted into those places, but that those places actually impact opportunity mm -hmm. for families. Take exactly the same person, uh, they live in different zip codes, and they have different life chances. And along with that, the sort of use of big data or technology tools is allowing us 
to move from just analysis of those problems to designing solutions in a way that we haven't been able to before. And so I think we are at an exciting moment um, to think about place-based policy. I, the other thing, maybe a, a little bit uh, more darkly, is that I, I think we are going through a geographic and economic change in the country that, that Jason also referenced, which is profounder than I think most of us realize. And, and um, I, I, maybe to be provocative, I would argue, and uh, the Kerner Commission was just raised, you know, 50 years ago, if you look at the, what the Kerner Commission recommended, and, and frankly, if you look at most of our social policy in the U.S., it was largely designed around the urban problem, around this challenge of poverty concentrated among uh, primarily African Americans in our central cities. And um, just to personalize this, I grew up in New York City. Um, I went to the Howard Cosell, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning uh, game. I, re I remember... Uh, you know, more broadly, this prediction that we were watching the death of American cities. And in fact, what we are seeing, I think, is quite the opposite, um, where increasingly in a knowledge-based economy, talent is gathering mostly in our central cities. Um, and I'm going to be very, you know, I'm generalizing here. Uh, and it's not just places like San Francisco and New York that are increasingly the gateways to opportunity, but it's, it's successful small and mid-sized uh, cities as well. The problem with that is primarily through the mechanism of housing costs, we are locking huge number of people um, out of economic opportunity in the country. And I think many of you have referenced Jay and others, you know, we're seeing less physical mobility, we're seeing less economic mobility, and we're seeing a greater sorting of people in, in places. And that has all kinds of economic consequences. It has racial consequences. It has political consequences. I would, I would suggest that not just in the US, but around the world, we're seeing economic polarization that is very much related to this geographic uh, uh, polarization. And I think in a lot of ways, if we look around the world, we're becoming much more like the rest of the world in, in the way that our urban patterns happen. If you think about places like London and Paris, if you think about Africa, you have poverty largely concentrated outside of the cities. And if uh, maybe to be even more provocative, if, if you think urban ghettos are bad, try suburban and rural ghettos, where it's a two-hour trip to get to work, where capacity to help uh, those folks is, is even lower than it is in most of our larger cities. And so I think we have ahead of us a, an era, because I don't think this is temporary, where these challenges of place-based policies are actually accelerating and will become more and more intense. And so um, I, I would frame, that it, one, that's one framing point. A second would be that uh, I think Governor Patrick made a very important point, which is that We've had these historic fights. I went to policy school and you know, learned about do we have people-based or place-based. And I do think it's a false choice, not just because you need both, but that the two are highly interrelated. If you think about, for example, Raj Chetty's work that shows the importance of helping people move using vouchers to higher opportunity neighborhoods, well, if you don't have place-based policies in those places that allow units that can be uh, affordable to voucher holders, you're never going to be able to help those people. And so this combination of, of people and place-based policies, I think it also points out, and we're spending a lot of time today on the places that are most disadvantaged, but I think we need to be talking more about what are the place-based policies in the places where economic opportunity is concentrated and is growing. And whether that's inclusionary zoning or a whole range of other anti-gentrification strategies so that a traditionally black center city neighborhood that is gentrifying, how do you make sure not just that current folks can stay, that you don't have you know, notices saying move back south and uh, actually succeeding in that, um, but also how do you make sure that future generations of low-income folks that don't have opportunity can move in? Because that's really the way over long-term neighborhood dynamics change. And so I think we have to think in, in balanced ways about uh, place-based policies for disadvantaged places and place-based policies for places that have growing advantages. So um, long-winded uh, uh, wind-up. But I, just, just to finish, I would really say um, 
as a federal, I, I worked in local government as well. I ran housing in New York. But from the federal perspective, I think it's really important to think about kind of four levers in, in place-based policy. And um, it, it is important to remember that we are a federalist system. I used to get together with my uh, counterparts in other countries, in Europe or Africa, the Asia, uh, and many of them I was in incredibly jealous of the powers they had. You know, well, we'll just pass zoning codes for the entire country, or we'll change the building code. And we have to remember that we have a federalist system where everything belongs to the states unless Congress specifically says the feds can do something about it. And I, I, I think that means money is obviously our, our largest lever. And how we f set formulas for that money, what conditions we set on it. But I think we do forget often that there are a few other ways that the federal government can make a big difference in place-based policy. One, I think, and it's, it's been touched on, but I want to be more explicit about it, is coordination. And, and I mean that in a couple different ways. First of all, there are, as Tracy has pointed out in her paper, billions of dollars of funding that go into places uh, we don't often think of them as place-based policies, but they are. Um, and yet, the federal government does a terrible job of helping or, or even not getting in the way of local places coordinating around that. To take a simple example, um, we know that infrastructure investments, transit, et cetera, are, can be transformative. But if you don't, when you put in a you know, metro stop, change the zoning, coordinate housing investments, you can first of all end up with you know, minimizing the economic benefit of that. But if you also don't think about the increase in land values and, and housing prices that are going to come with those investments, you may actually end up pushing out the very people you want to benefit for opportunity. And so that's, a, that's an example of, of ways to coordinate. I also think that there are ways that we can make sure to, to, uh, to go to Becky's point she made earlier, which I thought was really important is that so much of the success of place-based policies is dependent on the right leadership and coalitions on the ground. And I think we could do more in the federal government, um, and we tried to in the Obama administration, to make sure that the right people are at the table, that uh, low-income people and minorities are represented at that table, that there is real coordination that's happening, and that there is a successful strategy. The federal government shouldn't dictate that strategy, but we should be able to require that that happen. I think that takes me to a third point, which is accountability. Um, we, at the federal level, can help create uh, a requirement for metrics and outcomes, a requirement for research to ensure that uh, there, is, there is accountability as uh, uh, we, we go in. And then a, a final point is capacity building. One of the things I constantly saw around the country is local places that would say, I, I want a economic development strategy, I want a workforce strategy, and by the way, I have this great idea. And it was as if nobody else in the United States of America had ever tried that strategy. They were isolated on their own trying to figure out how to design it. And yet the federal government's in a position where we have seen people try to implement strategies all over the country, but do very little. We tend to talk one direction from Washington, which is to tell communities what to do, as opposed to listening to communities and thinking about the networks that you can create and spreading those, those best practices, helping to build capacity to implement. Um, all of that is something that I think the federal government, we often overlook as a, as a powerful tool in terms of creating success in place-based policies. That's, I think, really helpful framing for both of these proposals, and I want to return to a number of the themes that you've touched on. Um, but first, I want to ask Maurice a question about, it really is more about David Newmark's proposal, uh, which I think features a, a skill-building element that in some ways works like an apprenticeship. And uh, I wonder if this is something you think would work in places of concentrated poverty, and how could organizations like your own play a role in that? Uh, well, first, thanks for <clears throat> letting me be here. I was looking for something to disagree with my boss on, but <clears throat> I didn't find a whole lot. But we'll come up with something. Um, look, I think that the notion of helping folks find work in the private sector uh, is a team sport that certainly local nonprofits and local government and the federal government and the private sector um, uh, can work on and it can be beneficial for the places that we're working in. Um, 
there are it, but it by itself uh, won't have significant impact on the places that we're talking about. Um, because if, unless you are at one and the same time helping folks uh, get into jobs and helping them with housing issues and transportation issues, financial literacy issues, and all these other issues that they need to be good workers, getting folks into work is just not going to do it, right? So I don't have any disagreement with that. That is one component, though, of what needs to be a much more holistic approach to be helpful to the communities and the people in those communities that we work with. The other thing is, um, look, you need to help people get a credential that's marketable. Uh, so just focusing on getting into work and not focusing on a credential that helps that person get into work and then get um, ha constantly have a credential and experience that makes them marketable for higher and higher wage jobs um, is not gonna is not gonna be uh, of s as much service to the people that we're talking about as we want it to be. So apprenticeships have always assumed that you're not just getting work, but you're also getting a credential while you're getting work skills. And so whether that's a welding certification or whether that's a coding certification or whether that's working toward a four-year degree or a two-year degree, um, it is important in this day and age, and I would submit in our country, it will continue to be important, that that individual is both getting work experience and a credential that's marketable. Um, so I think you've got to pair all of that, but the biggest piece for me is work alone is not the solution. It is a part of the solution, no question about it, but the folks that we work with are wrestling with a more, their lives are more complicated, right? If they don't have child care, if that single mother doesn't have child care, all the work you put in front of her won't matter if she can't get her child cared for. She won't be at work. She'll be caring for that child. If you can't give her or him a transportation option that doesn't take two hours both ways, she won't be on time. So you have to approach this in a much more holistic way for the communities that we're working in for this to be a true solution. You need a strategy here just like you need a strategy for any business. That would be what I would add to it. I think your, your point is very well taken and I, I wonder, given the, the range of problems that, uh, that David's proposal aims to address, you know, does it, does it help to, to focus on the partnership between the local nonprofits and the national nonprofits? I mean, I, I wonder if in some of the places where you have extreme concentrated poverty, uh, if there might not be the capacity uh, with, you know, amongst the local nonprofits to kind of address this wider set of issues. And, and can organizations like LISC and other national nonprofits do something there? I mean, recognizing that certainly this is one piece of a larger policy effort. Yeah. So I, the answer to that is yes, although I think the bigger opportunity is what the federal government or what the public sector can do to leverage better relationships between the nonprofit world and the for-profit world. That's really the role that I think the federal government is best at, is um, how it can intervene to create incentives for the for-profit world and the not-for-profit world to work more closely together. The best apprenticeships, frankly, are when nonprofits are doing the pre-apprenticeship work for the large for-profits that have many more jobs. Uh, it's preparing people to get into their pipelines. That's probably the, the role when you think about segregating the, the jobs to be done. Um, it is probably the case that the nonprofits can play a better role in the pre-apprenticeship space, and the for-profits actually can play the better role in the apprenticeship space. And the question is what 
government can do to make that relationship sustainable and economically viable on both parts. That's what I would tell you is the more promising route. Thank you, that's, that's helpful. I, I want to now kind of pivot to a, a broader question that it, it's, I, just, I think it touches both of the proposals and I think it's important to, to talk about. Uh, I'm interested in the political economy of place-based policy more generally, as has been discussed to some extent by Jay and by Jason. Whether at the local or the state level, the allocation of these federal investments is presumably always going to be at least in part a political question. Um, are there ways to insulate the proposals like Tracy's from these political considerations? And I guess even taking a step back, is that even a, a sensible sort of objective to have, to want to insulate these? So that's a question for anyone who would like to. Yeah. Can I, can I start? Please. So yeah. I feel like there's the sort of textbook uh, response to that, and then there's the practical response. So okay. the textbook response is that moral hazard is a problem. We have these ways of dealing with it from individual transfer programs, which are tagging and our deal mechanisms. So tagging is basically you condition aid on something that people can't change, an observable characteristic that's immutable, like age, um, disability, blindness. Um, um, and then ordeal mechanisms is that you make it really, really hard to get benefits so that if you want to get benefits, you have to really show that you need them. Um, and so, you know, I've argued that the Recovery Act kind of mimicked those and a Department of Transportation had kind of chortled when I said that in terms of ordeal mechanisms dealing with the federal government. But there were, there were parts of the aid that were conditioned on things like unemployment rates, which you can't influence if you're a governor, whereas your budget is very much under your influence and even your tax system is under your influence in terms of your exposure to more volatile sources of income. Um, so that part of the increase in Medicaid that was tied to swings in unemployment, I think, was a very good step. Um, you could even go bigger and make it tied to your nearest neighbor's unemployment. You could make it tied to a regional measure. So there's lots of ways you can take it out of the hands of governors in terms of whether or not you get this additional federal aid. Um, and then the reporting requirements that came with the Recovery Act, I have been told a million times by people who are involved, were not supposed to be an ordeal mechanism. But you could argue that that sort of had the effect of not only increasing transparency in a way that I think we should continue to do in federal government, um, but you know, reducing some of these incentives to apply for stuff if you didn't really want it. Now, the practical consideration that I've had after my very brief stint in federal government, thanks to Jason, who's sitting right there, um, is, you know, and, and I've heard you say before, too, that you know, what we really want is to give money to places that are low resource, high capacity. And from a practical standpoint, I just don't know how you identify those places. I worry that um, you know, we can do something with a big splash in a place like Detroit where we had six cabinet secretaries show up and coordinate nonprofit and for-profit um, aid and continue to sort of play sort of a bully pulpit kind of a role, um, mobilizing local philanthropy for that matter. But what about a place, for example, like Puerto Rico, where um, even before the storm, you know, you didn't have the same kind of local philanthropy, you didn't have the same anchor institutions, you didn't have the same legal framework um, to help that jurisdiction get out of bankruptcy. So just, you know, when it comes to actually figuring out how to apportion limited dollars, how do you decide based on these issues like social capital that you really would like to reward, but are hard to observe, hard to measure, and hard to be, you know, unbiased and very transparent about? Yeah, um, we could spend a whole day. Oh, I'm, I'm thrilled. Let's do it. Um, let me just step back for a second and, and maybe um, even if slightly disagree with my former colleagues Jason and, and Becky on the the this issue of the skepticism about place-based policy to begin with, because it, it is absolutely true that uh, you know. We have examples of failure in place-based policy. We got a lot of examples of failure in other policy as well. Uh, you know, because the mortgage interest deduction is a poorly designed uh, policy to actually encourage home ownership, it doesn't mean we question tax policy itself. And I do think the political reality, as you said, Becky, is that politics will dictate that we do have place-based policies, and so we ought to figure out how to, how to best design them. I do worry more about the other thing that Jason mentioned, which is, which is scale, mm -hmm. um, that so often we're playing at the margins mm -hmm. of these problems with what we think of as place-based policies. And so one of the things I really like about Tracy's paper is to point out that the most important place-based programs are ones we don't even think about as, mm -hmm. as place-based. And I think a lot of our focus ought to be on 
how do we, going back to something I said earlier, how do we actually make these large grant programs, even uh, benefit programs, more sensitive to the differences between places and more effective in, in working together? And so the idea, for example, of automatic stabilizers or, or other things is really important in creating that sensitivity. I also will agree that politics are a huge problem here. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying it's true for just about every policy we, we make. And so I think a couple ways to attack that. Um, one is really thinking about how you minimize opportunities for politicians to make trouble <laughs> on these. Mm -hmm. um, and so a mechanism like an automatic stabilizer does that, right? You don't have to go to Congress and get increases when something happens because you're immediately mm -hmm. at a local level, you know, I, I look at the West Coast, San Francisco is a good example. They're, you know, uh, shooting themselves maybe not just in the foot but in the face in terms of their housing crisis because of the policy they have where every single building essentially has to go through zoning individually. Whereas a place like New York, you could rezone a whole neighborhood and have zoning that's as of right. And so you don't introduce as many opportunities to vote down uh, a project um, in, in a way that really hurts your ability to construct more housing, for example. And so th those are the, that's one kind of lever to, uh, to think about. Um, uh, another is really using the federal government's capacity um, to be the bad guy with, with state and local government on focusing resources. What do I mean by this? It is absolutely a political truth that the peanut butter strategy will prevail, um, meaning that if you give a grant with no accountability, you'll generally see a mayor say, well, I'm going to give a little bit to every council member, and we'll sort of spread it around uh, uh, a community. And I think it's been cr pretty clear that that is the least effective strategy for actually starting to make substantial change. And that instead, if you can have a coordinated strategy that really focuses on the places of greatest need, that um, is most likely to be impactful, but often federal government with state government or state government with local government has to create accountability mechanisms to try to focus resources uh, and, and develop strategies more uh, more effectively. And then, I, as I said earlier, I think there are ways to require better process at the, at the local level, uh, whether it's through things like affirmatively furthering fair housing that ensures that a locality has a strategy to make sure there's racial equity as an outcome for, uh, for these kinds of grants, things, things like that. And I think, lastly, just to go to your, your question about a place like Puerto Rico, I certainly would not advocate giving 100% of resources to places that have high capacity, right? And in fact, I think your proposal is right that most resources should be dictated on need. What I would say is I think where there are um, specific kinds of efforts, which we tend to think of as more place-based, right? Enterprise zones or choice neighborhoods or, or grants like that, where really you're trying to demonstrate uh, leading edge innovation around this, that's where I think you need to look for high capacity. Mm -hmm. At the same time, mm -hmm. we should be investing more at the federal level in capacity building, mm -hmm. right? So the issue isn't we're not going to give hurricane aid to Puerto Rico. What I think is important is to make sure that there's a very clear strategy and funding for mm -hmm. capacity building mm -hmm. uh, for, mm -hmm. for those places. because. You know, we shouldn't ignore them. On the other hand, we shouldn't ignore the problem that if we just give them money, it will likely not be successful if the capacity is not there to use it effectively. Just a quick note on the, the politics piece of this. Look, uh, it, it's just going to be there, right? <clears throat> yeah. What we really need is something analogous to a loan loss reserve, right? So we have enough cushion in these programs to take account for the bad decisions that are going to be made. <laughs> Just like banks need loan loss reserves for the bad decisions. Now, I, that's a wild idea. But that's, that's basically, you know, I, I'm, I can't remember who, who the poet was who said we, we sort of sit around dreaming of systems that are so perfect mm -hmm. that people don't have to be good, right? There is no system like that. People have to be good, right? And so, 
what we're ultimately hitting on is the ability to, of us to get good people in the right decisions in public policy uh, levels at both federal, state, and local. And we got a lot of work to do on that. But that's ultimately what you're talking about. There is no system, and we need the politics piece of it, uh, because the politics piece of it also has saved a lot of places from being overlooked, mm -hmm. uh, because people had the power to advocate uh, with their local government and their governors, et cetera. So it, 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 um, it's a mixed bag. While we're talking about the, the politics of this, I, there's something that struck me and that I see echoed in at least one question from the audience. And it's that Tracy's proposal is, it bypasses a lot of the skepticism about place-based policies in some interesting ways. And in particular, I would think that folks across the ideological spectrum might be able to agree that simply maintaining the level of state and local spending and the role, the relative role of state and local governments in our public policy, that doing that during a recession is something we could agree is a, a valuable objective. And I, I guess I wonder, is this your experience? Are, the, are proposals like yours, Tracy's, received in this way or, or no? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. I mean, so uh, you know, I worked at the local level and the state level and the federal level, and, and there's sort of these, you know, sayings that basically you forget where you came from. And so at the state level, people feel like you can't trust mayors. At the federal level, they feel like you can't trust governors. Um, but I think there was this emergency with the Recovery Act where the idea was you just had to get money out the door. So a little known fact about the Recovery Act is that, well, I often say the biggest misconception, a lot of people have misconceptions about it, that it didn't work, et cetera. I think the macro evidence shows that it worked. There's micro evidence that shows that it worked. Um, but it was misunderstood. And one of the big ways it was misunderstood is the idea that it was mostly federal. Half of every spending dollar flowed through, if not to, state and local governments. And about a quarter of every spending dollar went to state and local governments for uh, budget stabilization. So, uh, but it was, you know, people said, this is a bailout, it's not going to do anything. You know, states were profligate, they got themselves into this mess, that sort of thing. Even though their reserves were at a very high level before the recession, nothing could have prepared them for revenue losses on the order of 30% as happened in California in the matter of months between September and December of 2008. So, um, so I think that, you know, federalism is a you know, as you say, on the positive side, it can be a bipartisan issue because surely everybody agrees that we should have a well-functioning intergovernmental system where services are provided at a high level of quality um, and people are getting what they need. And, and yet it's also a bipartisan uh, issue in the sense that when states are not doing what people want them to do at the federal level, they say, you can't trust those people. So it, you know, the federal government basically does a lot of hard work raising revenue. Um, it's easier for the federal government to raise revenue through the income tax because people can't necessarily leave to avoid taxation, whereas at the local level, certainly they can. At the state level, to a lesser degree, they can as well. So the federal government has an advantage when it comes to raising revenue. They often recognize that state and local governments have an advantage when it comes to spending it, but they don't really like the idea of ceding that control Control once they've done the hard work of raising the revenue. The, to me, that seems like an inescapable issue, but I wonder if you disagree. Yeah, I, I agree. I would also add to that that just more generally, the politics of trying to be counter-cyclical, of trying to spend more when things are going badly is hard. Mm -hmm. And I, okay. uh, Jason uh, feels this pain uh, having sat through the economic crisis. And you know, frankly, the the politics of the not just the Recovery Act, but TARP and all mm -hmm. the different things that we did um, were brutal. Um, I, I, if you remember Rick Santelli, the CNBC uh, anchor who was on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, who started the Tea Party movement in some ways um, by saying, "Do you want to support those losers' mortgages?" Right? There, were, there was an enormous amount of anger, and continues to be about spending more in times when families are struggling and, and uh, it's harder to raise taxes. And so I do think that this is something where Tracy's idea and other ways that we can make sure that we're building into the system uh, a counter-cyclical uh, weight to help people in places that, that struggle in hard times is a really, really important thing. So I guess I, I want to pivot now. We've been talking a lot about the interaction of state and uh, federal government. And I wanted to talk, and, and one of the audience members wanted to talk about the, uh, the way that 
the kinds of subsidies that David Newmark proposes can catalyze private investment. So the interaction of uh, the public sector's work with, with the private sectors. And so this is specifically for you, Maurice, but also for anyone else. Yeah, no, I, I think that is the big opportunity with respect to um, his work is, or his proposal is, how you can use these public subsidies up front to actually catalyze the private sector stepping in and making it sustainable, right? And so that's, that's the point I was trying to make is <clears throat> the real opportunity is um, to have a system that helps the private sector see an economic incentive to actually invest its dollars alongside the public sector or in, in sequence. Um, and so the notion that you would spend 18 months subsidizing, in, in his proposal's case, a person a person's actual employment that would produce skills that that private sector employer uh, would see as marketable and then that private sector employer, if you will, coming in and still having a 50% subsidy um, for the next 18 months is, I think, the way you get to scale. Again, the point that I wanted to make, though, is from the perspective of that individual, there's more work to be done. I want that individual to walk away with skills and a credential. I want that individual to also be financially literate so they have an even stronger muscle to um, wrestle with the debts that they're gonna probably have to uh, get a hold of to really become net cash positive. I mean, at the end of the day, it's those things you need to do for that individual to build wealth, right? And jobs are one part of it, but just one part. But yes, I think the biggest opportunity here is how you use a proposal like this to ultimately uh, make a partnership between the public sector and the private sector that the private sector really is ultimately responsible for and sees an incentive for making it sustainable and scalable. Otherwise, it's a project that ends. Yeah. I think this is exactly right. The word I would use is how do you think about these investments as being catalytic, right? right? So that it's a, it's a relatively small amount of money that can then help to create a market in, in the long run. And I think one way to think about it is that, you know, what you're trying to do is subsidize initial investments in a way that you start to change the market. Right. And this is certainly true if you, if you think about the way places work. And this is my point earlier about spreading money like peanut butter. It's generally more effective to say, I'm going to think about a place where I can really make a significant investment and start to do something large enough to change the local market. And then that has spinoffs that the market starts to values rise or, or other things. But I think one of the other key things we often miss is that, you know, the private sector is made up of people with lots of misperceptions, biases, uh, you know, uh, ways that they see communities, particularly poor communities, that aren't necessarily right. And so what I often have thought about in, in designing policies to try to sort of catalyze market impact is rather than the government doing itself, something itself, how do you get the private sector in trying something and actually figuring out, hey, there's an opportunity here, uh, whether it's the grocery store we were talking about uh, earlier, um, what you often find, or the person that they hire from a neighborhood that they might not have hired before, is that 18 month job isn't just to build skills for that person, it's actually to build a different perception from the boss right. at that company that, hey, this is a person who actually works hard, you know, and, and so that's at a, at a micro scale. At a, at a larger scale, you think about FHA insurance, which is part, something that, that HUD has. We were often thinking we would go in 
rather than HUD building a project itself, if we could guarantee a loan where a private developer is coming in, you're then changing that private developer's perception, hopefully, about that market and the and the poss and starting to change other people's perceptions about it in a way that can catalyze markets as well. I know our time is up, but let me tell you, uh, for me, the other piece I like about it, at the end of the day, the private sector goes where talent is, right? Uh, the most important economic development asset is talent. And so if you've got a large scale way to produce marketable skills in a neighborhood, the chances that you will be able to attract a employer to invest in that neighborhood rise dramatically. So it is perhaps the biggest opportunity of his uh, proposal is that it is one of these talent preparation proposals that if you can do at scale actually can change the market in the neighborhood, can actually show employers that you know what, I've got workers here who can do the work and that's the most important asset I need. Well, thank you. I I think we actually have a bit of a hard stop here because another of our heads of state is trying to come into <laughs> this uh, this room. I have a bunch of questions and would love to the politics continue this. interrupts again. I know. Uh, I'd love to go on for another half hour, but unfortunately, I think we need to conclude. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. I'm going to say, what have I done here?